All right, dude, you're doing so many things wrong. I don't even know where to start. There, yeah, you ah. had it. You literally had the lighter facing the wrong direction, bro. He's got half of it. Yeah, you, before it even dude. Started. You, all right, now turn the gas off. Turn it I'll off. Turn it off. I'll okay, turn it don't off. burn the camera. What's up, guys? I'm here to tell you this episode is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a new, fast-growing, tech-enabled, well-capitalized, community-powered alternative to traditional health insurance. Founded by Andy Schoonover, a proven founder and entrepreneur with a successful track record, including a $100 million-plus exit. By the way, Andy's been on this podcast in the past. CrowdHealth uses the power of crowdfunding, member ratings, unlimited choice and huge cash pay discounts to provide a simple considerably less expensive solution to managing your medical bills crowd health gives you full agency and sticks with you no matter where you move or what jobs you take on you've heard of big pharma but you may not know big insurance is actually the man behind the curtain with 12 of the last 15 heads of the FDA taking jobs in big pharma and 64% of its funding coming from private industry, don't hold your breath waiting for the government to save the day. It's safe to say our system's broken. It's time to take your well-being into your own hands, and CrowdHealth helps you do just that. You'll pay into your individual account monthly, and if you ever want to leave, you'll simply pay a $250 closing fee, and they will return the entire balance in your account to you because it's your account because it's crowdfunded we all have a vested interest in each other's health they even cover up to three hundred dollars a year in routine wellness visits so far for every one hundred dollars members have paid into their accounts an average of only thirty dollars has been paid out so you can expect to see your money grow in your account over time take that big insurance Join today by visiting joincrowdhealth.com and using the promo code KLP to pay only $99 a month for the first three months. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code KLP. Joincrowdhealth.com, get you some. All right, boys, welcome to the podcast. After a year and a half, you back at it after a year and a half and one hour of Kobe getting his stuff together. <laughs> in the what? name, <laughs> in, the, in the name is can't let podcast still can't let. Okay. Yeah, same. It's right. same, same old, same. Old. Just took a year and a half off. Um, all right, Alan Dixon, what's up, my man? <sighs> Just living my best life. We've seen you on here before. A couple. I was of trying times. to count. What is it? Six, five? It probably was it that many. Because, I mean, I think I was on number two because Patrick was number one. I was number two. And then we had a second one. Remember, we were kind of talking about the time to pivot. Uh-huh. Yep. How many times have I been on with Mac? Uh, two. Two times with Mac. Uh-huh. And then I was on with Patrick. Yep. Plus, you were on, I think, some of the originals that we deleted because we did 25 podcasts a long Yeah, time that's what ago. I'm saying. There was two, I like think, of the originals. 2016 or 2017. And then, you know, so. All right. So, we've seen you before. Um, oh, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all. Just uh, go around real quick and introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, in real estate. Um, I got real, a, real got estate a, mogul. I'll I, got a, I got a few <laughs> ventures, but they're all pretty much <laughs> touch real estate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got a, so um, we'll get into that, but got a, a real estate team, got a development company, an investment company, married, three kids, all boys. Oh, yeah. With a... What is a five? No, five month old. Yeah, five month old. You don't ask yeah. me, bro. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you introduce yourself as baller a lot, or what do you <laughs> tend to go? With? Magic man. Magic man. No, yeah, magic okay. man. Not right. to be confused with magic man. Right. Uh, Tito Martinez, you have not been on the podcast before. I have not. We it's actually didn't don't know each other that well until recently, yeah, since we started uh, seeing each other at the gym together. That's correct. Yeah. Um, I was a it's a Saturday morning. Uh, for a jiu-jitsu promotion, I'm sitting on a wall, and I'm like, hey, 
that guy walking in. I think I know him. Uh huh. I had no <laughs> idea you were there. Yeah. No idea whatsoever. I didn't even know you were doing jujitsu. Yeah. My my wife uh, was asking prior to. She's like, hey, should I come to this uh, event to watch you be promoted? I'm like, no, it's no big deal. And then I come home. She's like, hey, uh, Kent was there. She's like, wait, wait, wait. So you had your church friend come, uh-huh. but not me, your wife. Like, <laughs> nice. like, so no, 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 it wasn't so nice. Tito um, recently got promoted from a white belt to a blue belt, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. And Attaboy. this was like two Saturdays ago. They were doing this seminar at the gym. And I went just because I'm trying to go to everything and didn't even know he was at the gym, didn't even know he was doing this at all, and was there for his belt promotion, which is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. In jiu-jitsu, great. that's a big, a big deal. Yeah, I, it, they tell you not to measure your success by like wanting a belt and a promotion. It, it comes when it comes. So you know the fact that it was given to me uh, was was pretty cool. So I, did you know going into that day that you were going to get a promotion that day? No, I mean I'm, I'm an engineer, so I like to deduce and en- and and to think about things. And I knew that I'd been there long enough that I felt like I should had have earned one. But at okay. the same time, like no one tells you. Um, that's what I was wondering. Right. No, it sounded yeah. like you knew going into that day, like that you're going to get a belt promotion. So Amy was thinking maybe she'd come to see it, but that was not the case. No, it was not. No, okay. no. A lot, a lot of it too is, um, with our instructor or, or at least to, from my understanding, there is no, um, curriculum. There's, there's no specific thing that you have to do to earn it. It's really d- dependent upon your instructor and their perspective of you and your skill sets. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone's going to be different. Mm-hmm. So, and the amount of time that you're doing it is a factor also, right? That is correct. Yep. 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 All right. So you're married. Yep. Been a um, baby. What else you want to say about yourself? And happily Introduce yourself. married eight years, just celebrated. So it's been, been a great ride so far. And I'm um, looking forward to the next eight mm-hmm. and beyond. Mm-hmm. Got a little 18 month old, little firecracker of a little daughter that I have. She's a handful. Um, apparently she's a spitting image and personality. Just like her daddy. So. That's cool. <laughs> uh, and you're an engineer, and I want to say you work on bridges. Is that right? <laughs> Close. Um, yeah, I'm a structural engineer, licensed in 14 different states. Um, do work for um, clients nationwide, primarily in the infrastructure and telecommunications division. Mm. So you're smart. Yeah. I like, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like math. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. On to you, Jarrell. Hey, by the hey. way, Jarrell Sensenig, who's also never been on the podcast before. Let's go. My man, Jarrell. Welcome, bro. Excited to be here, man. Tell the people about yourself. Um, yeah, so uh, married. My wife, Stacy. We're expecting our first um, in June uh-huh. um, next year. So we're excited about that. Yep. Uh, moved from Pennsylvania um, down here to Nashville in February of this year. Um, as you well know, um, in uh, know. business with Kent, uh, we have a rental rental business here in Nashville. Lifted, um, lifted, go lifted, yeah. L-I-F-T-D, what? it's spelled wrong on purpose. Look us up, look us up. Don't look forget the up. apostrophe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, man, we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're just, you know, getting to know Nashville, getting to know the city, uh, the people and, and friends and church and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, it's been a great ride so far and we're, we're excited about the future. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, we're and happy to be here with you guys. Happy you're here, bro. And, um, how is, how are you finding Nashville so far? If someone is thinking that like, maybe, you know, they're interested in Nashville, what, how are you finding <laughs> it? Yeah. It's interesting. Cause, cause by the way, people move here. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like I know yeah, people yeah. move into other cities too, <clears throat> but people are moving to Nashville a lot. Yeah. I think what I found even just from talking to people is there are, there are a lot of new people in Nashville. It's hard to find a. Um, just like a old head that grew up here, um, was born and raised in Nashville. It's hard to find that. Um, and it seems to be kind of like a stepping stone. I, I don't know if that's because of the music industry or what that is, but it seems to be a lot of people come in, you know, spend their time here and move on. But what I found in Nashville, um, I always thought of it as, you know, it's music city. So you got country music, you got all these, you know, it's music, music, music. And, uh, I think what I've really enjoyed about Nashville is finding like the, the spots outside of downtown Broadway. I mean, we don't, we never spend time down there anymore. It's like, you know, any other place we can find that's um, relaxed and you can sit down You can call me old, but sit down and listen to some music and, and not have rowdy bachelorette parties everywhere you go, man. It's <laughs> pretty nice. So, Heck yeah. um, but no, I, I really enjoy that. It's a busy place. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's thriving right now. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of business. There's a lot of there are a lot of young people to colleges and everything like that. It's a lot of young people, so there's a lot of life here. Um, 
but uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I people come and go, <clears throat> but I think that's more because it's a city than than it has anything to do with the music scene. Yeah, I think because yeah, cities think are just so. more transient. Yeah, you know? it seems to be like Nashville seems like from from everyone you talk to that's moving here, it's like it just seems to be like the cool place to go um, with the young with the young crew. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of colleges around, so that 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 definitely has something to do with it. But but mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that come to college here and then just stay because they love it. Yes. Uh, so it I think I think it definitely once you live here and you get to to know this to know Nashville for the city that it really is and not just the the Broadway part of it you kind of start to see why it's why people would want to live here and yep um, so yeah we're 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 definitely enjoying it more the longer we're here um, there's no doubt about it at first it, it seemed like kind of hectic but now it's it's settling down you know we got a house and everything like that and it, it's starting to to feel a little more like home yep so. All right, so um, how would you guys... Ah, shoot, I messed that up. How would you guys define woke, and do you see it coming or going right now? It was supposed to be a little bit of a joke to get it, get it break the ice. <laughs> but it is an honest I mean, question. We can jump in right there. I mean, the transition, I, 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 think, I think with the woke piece, I, I, to me, I don't, I don't know. I, I, obviously, it's alive and well i mean i think when when you get to the point where you just you don't have the common sense to think through what i mean i think the quote woke culture is so outrageous that i i see i almost like a push with some some young people like it's not even cool to be woke at times (laughs) you know i mean it's it's that (laughs) bizarre what do you mean meaning meaning like you know, every, I thought you know, it was cool to be woke. It, it is cool to be woke among some, but I mean, there comes to a point where if, the only way to re- I was I saw what it was a Tim Dillon, is a comedian. Mm-hmm. He was talking about the young kids. You know, used to get just blue, dye your hair blue, you know, and get a nose ring, and now you know, now everybody's so woke. You have to be a a Christian again to be you know out of the norm. Uh, uh-huh. You yeah, know, true. Yeah. But, wow. How would you guys define it? Because I don't. I'm not clear on what that even really means. Looks to the young guys for it. Um, man, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it is kind of hard to define because I don't really, I mean, it's, I try to stay out of it as much as I can, to be honest with you. But do you stay out um, of politics in general or? Uh, usually, yeah. yeah. Um, I do. Um, I just think that there's just such a confusion of what truth really is right now um, that it, you know, it's like anything can be a reality now to people it's Mm -hmm. like it doesn't matter you know you can identify as whatever you want to identify as you can um you know you can be whoever you want to be and it you know that's not reality it's not truth and so the truth is getting blurred and um so i would just yeah i i i would just to sum it up in in one simple word it's it's confusion honestly um to me it's just it's just confusing it's like I, i i don't even know that the people that are in that that woke class that you would consider woke or even know what they're doing half the time. Um, so it's just confusion. Uh, and maybe that's just for me. I don't know, but I, I just find it confusing. Yeah. It appears confusing for sure. Tito, are you very involved politically or do you stay out of that also? I do try to stay, stay out of it. And I think that's just because of my perspective is in the minority, Mm. uh, more traditional. And so, you know, the woke culture I think is, what is truth at this present moment? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it is defined by, you know, whoever you align yourself with. And, you know, Nashville is a blue dot in a red state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's alive and well. We see it constantly. Um, What do you mean you were, you you said you're a minority and you have, what did you say, a traditional perspective? Is that what you said? Yeah. What what is, are you saying those are kind of juxtaposed a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Traditional beliefs. Okay. um, you're a minority that has traditional yeah. conservatives beliefs. Correct. And that's not, that's not it's, all. It would be the opposite of what current world culture. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, okay. I got a question with that. Okay. From, from that minority perspective, I, th- I think a lot of woke culture is really pushing toward like, I, I guess trying to capture that minority. W- w- okay. Let me, from your perspective, from, from that minority vantage point, it feels like, you know, either it's the Democratic Party or just in general wokeness and, you know, feels like, all right, well, we're going to, we're protecting the minorities. We're protecting uh, all these marginalized groups. How do you, how do you perceive that? Or how does the, 
your the minority from your perspective perceive like with within does that make sense like like you can see it from the outside right but what is the internal perspective you know it's does that make hey, can sense you, can you pull that mic a little closer there, tito yep yeah, that makes sense i think it's a i think my perspective will be a little bit different and so i don't want to say that all minorities think this way but we come here to pick ourselves up every day by our bootstraps. And I think the woke culture is telling us as a minority group, how others should be helping us. Mm. And that's not the way I was raised. Uh, and I would argue that the minority community that I grew up in doesn't view it that way either. Um, and I would also argue that the woke culture in a large part is the face of it is not a minority individual. Okay, that is that is very interesting because I agree with that, which um, doesn't really pass like a quick sniff test, you know what I mean? Like, so what's going on? If that's the case, why is that the case? Because that makes it start to feel a little bit more like maybe uh, there's a, I mean, agenda is a little overused, but... It does make it feel like it, there's a, like an agenda being pushed or something if the face of it's not even minority. So yeah. what's up with that? I think so. Well, these are the type of things you like to stay I away guess, from. I, well, I, mean, I just wonder. I mean, I guess, I guess I see a lot of people who feel like they need to be offended on behalf of other people, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a you know white person. I need to be offended for the minority population, the black population, the LGBTQ population, you know, almost like this need. I need to be offended based on other people, right? I, I, that, that's the way I'd, I see a lot of times, and maybe that's a, a skewed view. But I think there's also the, the concept of um, they don't have a voice or they haven't had a voice historically, so someone needs to be that voice, mm -hmm. someone of a position, someone of power. Um, and so I think, you know, the people that are leading that conversation are, are not, you know, individuals that look like me. Mm -hmm. Were your parents, uh, born in America? No, no, no. Where are so they from? My, both my parents from originally from Mexico. Mm. Um, my mom migrated here when she was 15 by herself to wow. find work and support her 17 siblings and mom back home in Mexico. Wow. At 15 no years old. way! It's crazy, it's incredible. How about her dad? What was the situation? He, he died. Oh yeah, um, yeah. When she, she was how old? When your mom was how old? She was probably in elementary school, if I remember correctly. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. he he worked on the railroads. Um, I've been to, I, so I obviously never met him, but I've been told he was a a mountain of a man, just like a big burly dude. Um, worked on the rail yards. On you know, ended up dying um, through an accident. So my mom was looked at as the the leader of the group, even though she was like the the fourth oldest one in the, the out of the eighteen. So why her? 18. I I think it was her personality. Mm -hmm. Um, she just even to now she's always been a very selfless individual that always um, served others, and so she made the trek here to the states, and then my father, he came over when he was I think seventeen or eighteen. Um, his, his older brother was paying for him to go to school and his older brother ended up passing. And so the money stopped. So he had to take over the reins as the second oldest to, to help out the family. So same concept. Uh, there's no opportunity here in Mexico. I need to go find work. So came to the U S um, and started working as a laborer. And then my parents in time ended up finding each other. Um, they lived in, I think the same apartment complex. Oh yeah. Yeah. And in, in their twenties and, you know, got married and, you know, and that was in the Houston, Texas area. How many kids did they have? How many siblings do you have? So I'm the middle. I have an older and a younger sister. Okay. So how many siblings did your dad have? He was one of four, I believe. Okay. So your mom, All brothers. there was 18. Your mom had 17 siblings and then she chose or whatever your dad and mom. They only had three kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think that like... Usually people who have a lot of kids, they kind of continue that trend, but 
I would think. Did you uh, ever talk to her about that? Like, why didn't they have more? Or no, I, I think a lot of it was just the economics. They were very aware of the financial um, commitment that that families were, and they both were still very much supporting their families back in Mexico. Mm. I think three was what they felt God called them to have. Okay. Are they both still living? Yep. Your mom and dad? Mm-hmm. Where do they live? Yep. They're in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida. Okay. Yeah, South Florida. Now, <clears throat> we go to church together. Mm-hmm. Um, were you raised Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Um, both my parents were devout Catholics. Uh, my mom, when she came to the States, was um, kind of taken under the wing of a, of a woman that was uh, a Baptist. And so my mom ended up converting to becoming a Baptist. And then when she married my dad, my mom converted my dad from being a very strict Roman Catholic to, to being a Baptist. Really? And then, yeah. Wow. And then when we, I think I was, uh, I was born in South Florida. So when they moved, when they left Houston and came to South Florida, they became members of a little Hispanic church. Hmm. And my dad ended up becoming um, a, a, the head deacon. Oh, yeah. At the church, yeah. Oh, so, cool. I, so I grew up with church down my throat. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Southern Baptist Convention was uh, strong in South Florida, for sure. Really? Especially amongst the Hispanic community. Really? Wow. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. It, okay. Uh, Dr. D. James Kennedy and that era of, of ministry leaders were huge hmm. um, within our community. Okay. Do your parents still send money back to relatives in Mexico? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. My, my mom's side, mostly my dad's siblings have passed. So he's he, he doesn't have any siblings, I think, anymore. He may have one, you know, far removed brother, but um, mostly it's my mom's side that we still support. So, okay, and so so at this point, there, your mom is supporting her siblings still. Well, it, it, at this point, it's just her mom, my grandmother. She's, oh, she's ninety three okay. now, and so uh, the medical care system in Mexico really, or as it's been explained to me, has doesn't really put a lot of priority on elders and the elder community. Mm. And so, you know, it, it's usually they have a problem. They're like, uh, you know, they don't really dig into it. They don't try a whole lot. And so the money that my mom sends back now, it's to support my, my grandmother. Um, the rest of her siblings are, are fine on their own. Mm. Do uh, you feel, okay, so <clears throat> when I hear about minorities, most of the time they're not talking about, um, Hispanic people. Do you feel that's an overlooked segment of the minority population? No, I, I'm anywhere I go, I see them. <laughs> no, but I, but I mean, I don't mean, obviously there's, there's a, a bunch around Nashville, but I'm saying. Like politically? Um, yes. I, I think prim- predominantly the, the topics that you'll see is uh, border security um, okay. and the, the DACA, the, the dream, the dream act. Those are probably the two big things that are, heavily sway the Hispanic population, I would argue. And, but you're right. I think outside of that, you don't really hear much. You know, there's no big movements other than that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like when, when it comes to looking out and inviting in minorities, I don't hear many discussions and it could be, I'm just not listening to the right people or the whatever. Maybe it's the circles I run in. I don't know. I just don't hear many discussions about inviting in, Hispanic people. Yeah. Is that because that they tend to be overlooked in these discussions or? I, I, I wonder, I mean, and this is a question, I don't know. I mean, all the Hispanic Latino, you know, uh, the community that I know, like you mentioned a lot of the attitude that I guess being in the construction industry, as you would imagine that I, a lot of the people that work with me and for me or, you know, are within that community extremely hard workers. Mm-hmm. And, and so what my That's experience, right. my experience is I, I don't feel like there's a lot of this feeling of what well, I, I want to hand out. I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, at least, at least from my perspective, no, is that uh, true? I, I think so. And, that's and I just wonder I if, saying. is that, is that a reason why maybe there's not a huge outcry within the Latino community? I don't know. Growing up, wondering. I definitely think the, you know, the, the family members I had and the friend groups I had were heavy in the trades. Mm-hmm. construction industry and these were people that every day woke up very early worked 12 16 hour days getting paid whatever it was um to support their families and that was the focus right mm-hmm. and so the idea of uh 
having and advocating for things just when at what point in their day would they have time for that right it was i'm i'm going to work my kids need food my my family back home needs shelter whatever it was you know it was we're dealing with the problems of today the problems of right now mm-hmm. I, I was just going to say I, I you know that's that's one of the things that i i wonder i mean whether it's going with that thought or the woke community or whatever it may be <clears throat> you know i i feel like there's a lacking of self accountability within our culture period mm-hmm. right like to me i the the big push that I feel like, whether it is within the world community or X or Y or Z, I feel like there, it, it seems to me like there's a big sense of entitlement of like, if I'm going to get somewhere, if I'm going to do something that I, then I deserve to get that from somebody else. And I just wonder, you know, is, does that fuel a lot of the narrative in today's society of like, well, I'm, I'm this. And, and it's hard to say that as a white male, I get that, you know, I, you know, a friend of mine was joking around one time and said, well, you're top of the food chain, which it's fair. All right. Okay. That's fair. It's fine. Um, but as a white heterosexual male, um, it's, it, but it, it, whether it, you still have to ask, is that truth? Right. Is that, mm-hmm. is that truth of like, do we as a society, are we holding ourselves accountable for our life and for our decisions and for whatever we may choose to do in life? Mm-hmm. I mean, my wife is much more compassionate than I am. She's going to be a therapist and all this stuff. And we are, we tend to debate a lot because, you know, she's in the studies and we're talking about this and I have a hard time because I'm just like, you get up and you just freaking do it. You know, you get up and work. I I don't want to hear about why all the reasons why you can't do something. And I mean, that's hard. Again, that's coming from me and my perspective. And I'm sure that would be criticized by a lot of people. (laughs) Right. But I mean, I tend to have that view of if you want something, you go freaking get it. You go work and you, you make it happen. You know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Um, we was not super poor, but my mom used an outhouse until 1979. I mean, that's, wow. you know, wow. when you think about like poor, my mom, my dad built my mom's first indoor plumbing when she was started dating my dad at 17. If that gives Whoa. you perspective. Like when in you Tennessee. think of in Tennessee, when Tennessee. you think about like backwoods That's Tennessee, crazy. that is that is the you know the where I come from. Now I didn't I didn't have to obviously do that, but like you know she kind of grew up with that perspective of you know you got up, you just went to the creek and you grew, you gathered the water and you made you you took a bath. And so I think in a lot of ways she instilled that into us. You know she would say all the time, "I'm not going to have lazy children. I'm not going to have lazy children." Oh, yeah. really 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 hammered that home with us which i think ultimately has served me and my siblings mm-hmm. very well but i mean that that's the thing i think that bothers me most in today's society is you know are we are we holding ourselves accountable for our own decisions well life? where do you think that shift happened because i mean is it like a, is it do you think it's just a cycle that happens because i i feel like there was you know, and I think about my parents as well. It's like, there's that hard work ethic to get you to a a certain spot. And then is it our generation that came through and was just like, we just expect that to happen. And it was just like, what's that, what's that saying about, um, uh, hard times make strong men, you know, strong men make easy times, easy times make weak men. Like weak men make hard times. Weak men make yeah. Weak men make hard times. Yeah. So like, is that just? Do you feel like that's a cycle, and we're just going through that kind of that phase right now? Is it like, is it, you know, our generation that, quote unquote, screwed that up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, our parents worked super hard to get us to this place, and now we're kind of in that like just, you know, we we just kind of expect those things to happen. Um, I'm curious on that because you you would kind of be. You know, and you would kind of be in the middle of that, but like my generation and what we're going through right now is just like, you know, I, I, I just wonder where that, where that shift would have happened mm-hmm. or if you have any like insight of, of, to where that would have changed. Well, I think the one thing I think of is, uh, what's it called? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Is that right? Yeah. Where like, you know, you, you focus on what you need most, mm-hmm. you know, like if we were all starving right now, we would not be sitting in my garage doing this right, podcast. Right. We'd be looking for food. Yeah. Uh, if we didn't have home, if, if, if I didn't have a home, 
we also wouldn't be sitting here doing this podcast. We'd be looking for a place to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you start with like the most basic needs and then you start to fill those in. And then at some point, way, way, way up the line from like the most basic, you're having, um, you're having, uh, like conversations or you're thinking about your, uh, you're having to decide, like, you're going to send your kids to public school or private school. Right. Like we have these conversations and we talk about it. It's like, Oh, you know, we have friends at public school. We have friends at homeschool. We have friends that go private school. It's, it's all good in my opinion, whatever the parent decides. But if you think about that being a choice in society, the truth is that's way up from the bottom of like the most basic needs. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about like that's a even, blessing. Dave. You don't have to yeah. discuss those things. Yeah. So what we're talking about is even up further than that. You know what he, I mean? I mean, so I think we, in today's society, we have access to so much. It's, we have, we're a wealthy society. Yeah. Uh, there is a huge safety net for the most part. And so then you can sort of not think about, you know, I don't know, 95% of the things that historically humans have had to think about. Mm -hmm. It's just taken care of. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know, I don't know how old you are, but Drell, I know you're a little bit younger than Kent and I, but I, th I think about, let's go a little, how, how do you? <laughs> oh, man, what are you talking about? What, what, I'm 28. 28. All right, you ain't that bad. Okay. Tito, how old are you? 35. Really? Oh, you're, you're the same hey. age. Okay. All right. So, okay, our generation. But, like, you know, you think about two. <laughs> <laughs> you're a young looking you look, 35 you look, year old, You're a good looking 35 dude, you're going to be rolling until 100 at least. Yeah, I'm calling I'm it right now. I'm hoping I'm looking back at 35. The gym, they'll be man. like, dude, how old are you? And I'll tell them. They're like, what? Yeah. Yeah. But you were at least, like, maybe 25. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. The, the, okay. young. You're going to go a while, bro. <laughs> I'm looking back. All right. So, you know, as a product of the 80s, my parents were a product of the 60s, right? Which meant their their parents were a product of the 40s, the Great Depression. And yep. I mean, and, you know, if you think about the stereotypical parents that were born in the Great Depression or that era, you know, very hard, you know, you just, you, you, you lived and you worked, you did everything you could, but they wasn't exactly emotionally available, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then when you got to our parents' generation, the 60s, this is when drugs took off and this is the flower generation and all the things, you know, I feel like there might have been a huge shift at that time of almost like an overcompensation of what they didn't get from their parents. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I mean, that that's ultimately when the eighth place trophy started really taking root of like, you know, it's, it's we don't want to hurt any feelings. And I think as it's kind of going on now, we don't want to hurt our kids feelings, you know. And, and so, yeah. like, there was that overcompensation of, like, well, maybe they didn't get what they felt like they needed emotionally or, you know, now I've got more wealth than my parents did. And I just, oh, I think I bumped this camera, but, um, you know. It's okay, I, it's Jarrell's camera. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think that when we overcompensate and we overcoddle our children, we create a generation of entitlement. Yes. You know, and I don't think, I don't think my generation is doing anything to help the situation. Right. I, I definitely think growing up, I saw, you know, my parents, they grew up dirt poor. Like my, my mom's house was essentially um, Connex boxes, right, with, with dirt floors, right? And so their idea was we when we get married and have kids, we want to make sure that we can get them the education we never could get. So that was, you know, priority number one, you know, and so what I've seen between me and, and others in my age who are who, who I grew up with, the elimination of struggle mm. was yeah. was key. Mm -hmm. Now, still good people, you know, they, they grew grew into being adults and whatnot, but I think at the end of the day, as parents, we always want to you know, with an eighteen month old, I want to make sure that I can give my daughter the things that I didn't have, mm -hmm. which to be honest, you know, what is that? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um like, what are you going to be able to give your 18-month-old daughter the next 20 years that you didn't have? Right. Like, I mean, a, yeah, a, a brand new car when she turned 16. Like, is yeah. that is that really beneficial for her just because I didn't have one, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but for my parents, it was, you know, we no TV Monday through Thursday nights. You know, you, you want to watch TV. It was Friday or Saturday. Mm -hmm. You couldn't sleep in on the weekends. You had to get up and do your chores. Mm -hmm. You had to play sports. Like, they made sure that we had struggles of our own you know, ability to, to manage. And because of that, I feel like there's that level of personal accountability that we were, it was instilled in us. Mm -hmm. and I think over time, not all parents did that. And I think you, we see that in 
the generation that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And I think still we are trying to eliminate the struggle that uh, kids need, in my opinion, to to really develop. I agree with that 100%. Yeah, and I feel like technology plays a big role in that too. I mean, you know, for our parents, it was like, hey, you had to work to go, you know, you had to go out there and grind and and work with your hands and and get down dirty to get to make money. And now it's like, I mean, you can you can make money from sitting at home, you know, if you're good with technology. And so that I think that plays a role in too of like, you know, to be honest, you really, you know, you don't really have to physically work that hard necessarily to to make a good living, you know, and and that's part of the blessing of where we're at, you know, in in the world. But um, but then it also can that can breed you know, those, those, th- that laziness, if you want to call it that, or just that, like, feeling like you don't have to really have to work that hard to get, to get to where you want to be at. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think technology plays a, a, a pretty big role in that as well. Um, yeah, I, going. I totally agree with that. And I do think it's, it's very important to distinguish because w- the, the thing about woke is it starts to lump in stuff that doesn't belong there. And, like, one example of that I think is, like, social justice. I think it would be silly to say that everyone, no matter their skin color, has been treated the same in this country. I mean, for crying out loud, we had slaves at one point in this country. Mm-hmm. Actually, not that long ago. Mm-hmm. So, there, we have more work to do in terms of social justice, which is also sort of, um, that term has become also politicized. And I know their their politics get involved with that too, but I think that's an unfortunate thing to lump in with woke because they're very two they're two separate things. Um, so I'm coming back to this definition of woke, and Colby, I know you're still setting stuff up over there, but could you Google that? Is, is that a possibility? Can we? Yeah, because I feel like the intentions was was good. It was to hey did. Are you aware of the privilege maybe you had, or are you aware of the the struggles other people are 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 facing day in day out that maybe this other person doesn't face? But I think it's swung so far now that it is, for sure, almost uh, just it's insane. It's it's so confusing. Sorry, yeah, I was it, I was laughing thinking about Theo Vaughn talking about growing up very poor, being like I I don't know about this privilege, but I wish I would have had some. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, I think, um, and this isn't to take away anything from anyone, but I do think another group that goes overlooked often in this country is poor white people. And, like, you know, maybe this is like tin foil hat stuff or whatever, but so I don't know if there's anything to this, but I have heard a couple of times someone express their opinion on some of this. Um, the politicization. All right, their their viewpoint is actually what we're dealing with here is the difference between a wealthy person and a poor person, and we're masking that by actually shifting people's gaze to talk about the woke stuff. We have a real problem in this country with the disparity between the wealthy and the poor. I think it's pretty hard to argue with that. I mean, there's a lot of poor white people. There, no, I, in there's this no country. Question. I mean, I I know a lot. I mean, again, I, I grew up in. Defeated Tennessee. So I know a lot of, of, of very, very, very poor white people, you know, living on $400 a month, right? Which, I mean, you know, I guess, can, you know, in the, in the world, it's still doing all right. But in, in America, it's, it's a pretty poor person. Um, but I just want to make that point about when I'm, when I talk, because let's talk more about woke, but I think that it, I'm not talking about social justice. Like that book, The Coddling of the American Mind, that came out, I think, in 2017 or 2018. Did any of you guys ever read that? That's a really oh, eye-opening. No, I haven't seen Eye-opening what book. What is it? The Coddling of the American Mind. Because a lot of the stuff started in colleges. Um, and it's now it's now these, these college people are getting, you know, somewhat brainwashed at some of these colleges, and then they're graduating going into companies. And now the companies are getting influenced by what they learn in college. And now the companies, a lot, a lot of them are tech. And they influence society. And so now it's like infiltrating into society. And it's a long play, but it's effective. So woke, aware of and actively attentive to important societal facts and issues, especially issues of race and social justice. So that cuts exactly against what I was just saying. <laughs> it almost glue, like, because I don't, together. I don't think of woke as that. 
I think we have societal issues, and I think they well, should be addressed. Well, well here, going back to what you were saying, I think the intention of or why people started using it in the first place was, you know, a good thing. But eventually you started having these crazy ideas and these crazy, you know, uh, narratives starting to pop up under and it, and it all kind of got lumped under the same umbrella. Well, if you if you cared, then you would support X or if you cared about society, you would or if you cared about this, uh, you know, marginalized people, you would, you would care about why, or you would believe the way that I believe. And that, you know, that all kind of started encompassing under the same umbrella. And and I think that's where this negative connotation ha- has come about, you know, to go to your point. Well, I think it's also, I, I sort of feel like um, the woke thing has become largely about transgender issues. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I mean, that's what it feels like. The transgender lately. voice seems to be the, that discussion seems to be like the most common mm-hmm. when you're talking about those things. But it does seem to be like a, um, it seems like there's waves of things now that spread through society. And this is to your point, Drell, about technology and social media and the internet. Cause like these, these viewpoints like flow through society. Like right now, um, anti-Semitism is like the big thing i think it's because of what is it ye or yay i don't know kanye yeah. yay, some maybe. of the stuff yeah some of the stuff I he was know. saying recently about like right um and literally yesterday i was driving to the gym and there was a billboard on 65 it says anti-semitism is bad for everybody it starts with the jews but it never ends there i'm like i'm trying to follow that logic for a second anti-semitism is bad for everybody it starts with the jews but it never ends there like Anti-Semitism is bad because it's like anti-Jew. Like, isn't that enough? Like, it's bad because of that. Okay, who cares if it spreads <laughs> to anyone else, right? Like, it's just bad because it's your you're anti-Jew, and that's right. not a good thing. Uh, to me, okay, here here is the problem that I have with a lot of a lot of the narrative today is, okay, you know, take take anti-Semitism, right? Uh, obviously, it's it's idiotic right the the problem is not that you look at something you say it's 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 dumb you know but when you start telling people this is how you must think like Mm -hmm. like like dumb isn't illegal right i mean at the end of the day like the the this whole country was based on this idea of you could have a belief that i disagree with and as long as you're not harming other people like we have the freedom to believe and i think one of the things if we're talking about the the woke and like think things like pronouns and you know things like that like in Canada transgender like what what I'm getting at is like okay there's a big difference between restricted speech and forced speech like there there that's a chasm right. between it like it's one thing if i say i i i hate x people and i say that and they say whoa 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 you can't say it okay that i mean it's it's a lack of freedom of speech even if it's dumb right that's that's one thing but to say now you must say x y or z the problem is is what that what that's doing in society is saying now you must affirm this belief it's one thing to say you believe something but i don't i'm not going to allow you to express it it's another thing to say there's a belief that you don't agree with but you must affirm it or there you could go to jail Mm -hmm. to me that's a huge thing and and i mean you know the the idea of the freedom of speech is protecting somebody that hates you Right. I think at the end of the day, being able to say that person hates me, but guess what? I defend their ability to say that. And to me, that's what this country is built on. And I mean, you know, places like Canada have already got to a place in their society. It's like, no, no, you must affirm someone else's belief, even if it goes against your conscience. Yes. Yep. That's wow. that to me, that is what is scary. Yeah. And um, I mean that again, that there's a chasm between restricted speech and, you know, forced. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. huge, huge difference. Yep, I totally agree. I think uh, one thing that for some reason, well, I guess I guess this would make sense logically. It feels like anti... Um, and I'm not trying an, to... Let me, let me be clear. I'm not trying to support anti-Semitism or racism or anything like that. I, I think they're all morbidly bad. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but, but to go in to say I'm, you know, I'm going to force you to think or say a certain thing, mm-hmm. that gets dangerous mm-hmm. in a, in a society. Yeah, I agree. 
but also like anti, how would you put this? Anti male, anti masculinity. Oh, it feels yeah. like that's one of the things that's lumped in with woke culture. Yeah. Toxic masculinity. Toxic yeah. masculinity. For what sure. even is toxic masculinity? Because this is the one thing um, that I think that they actually, I think, can have really great branding. Because when you brand masculinity as toxic, when I say masculinity, if that's all I said right now, tell me if like part of you isn't like, ooh, can we talk about that? Masculinity in general. Yeah. Right? Like it's, they have, we've gotten so pervasive with lumping masculinity in with toxic masculinity that now when we say masculinity, it feels somewhat toxic. Or is that just me? Yeah. Yeah. It definitely feels like you're walking on eggshells. Yeah. It does feel like you're walking on eggshells, but we're just talking about masculinity. But society has done such a good job with pulling in toxic with that word masculinity that now it's like, it's like tainted a little bit. Right. Um, on that note, this is, you know, we, we're just going to talk about whatever we want to talk about tonight. Right. So this is about it. We're I have, back I have, after I have, 18 look, months. I will say we're this. Just, we're drink, you're drinking uh, whatever. By the way, Tito brought a crap <laughs> can, ton of bourbon. Can you hear me, talk about <laughs> can you hear me that lighter? Smoking cigars. So we want to talk about whatever we want to talk about. I, but I, I was, did want to talk about masculinity. Oh, 100%. I, I definitely want to talk about that because as a father of three boys now, <laughs> um, I think about this constantly. You're right. You know, I, I, I say it to a point where it's almost a joke at the house. But I always have this thing of like every time the boys are doing something, I say struggle. The struggle makes the man. You know, the mm, struggle makes the man. You know, mm-hmm. the boys are the boys are not. You know, they can't figure something out. They're getting pissed and crying. I'm like, look, struggle makes the man, kid. Just I figure like it that. out. I'm gonna right? steal that. That's a, that's you know, a um, because I, 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 you know, to the point where my, you know, Lauren will start joking. Like, I get it. What you're gonna say struggle makes the man. You know, um, but I, I just. I, I want to hear your thoughts on that because to me, I think that I, I don't remember which one was talking about it, but the lack of struggle in society, especially on, uh, among men, I, I don't know how, how necessary that is for women. I don't know. Maybe it's not necessary at all, you know, but at least within men, I think the, the struggle that we go through really, really, really plays into who we become. Dude, That's 100% yeah. it does. And uh, Stephen Mansfield, who wrote a book on the Mansfield's Book of Manly Men and has studied this um, and has been on this podcast maybe once or twice. But uh, you have don't turn it all the way up. All right, so, dude, you're doing so many things wrong. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> First of all, you want to barely turn it on. Just barely. barely. Second of all, all his gas. second. Of, there. Yeah, you ah. had it. You literally had the lighter facing the wrong direction, bro. <laughs> Uh, you're going for cigar number two? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll get there in a second. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> He's got half of it yeah, you, before he even dude, started. You, all right, now turn the gas <laughs> off. Turn it I'll off. I'll turn it off. Okay, I'm turning don't it burn off. the camera. I'm turning it all right, off. All right, now you guys see why I put the water jug far from he, Alan. Half yeah, your cigar okay. is gone, dude. Where'd it go? <laughs> That's because he burned a hole halfway <laughs> down the bottom of it. <laughs> His cigar uh, looks like one of those dudes with a hole in their neck. Lauren, right? so come you're gonna get your to, man. You're going to have to plug Look. that cigar hole. That's why Somebody I'm come get your man. <laughs> now, I'm not used to these big ones. Anyhow, Stephen Mansfield, I don't know. It was in his book. And I don't know if the thought's original with him or not. It probably isn't, but also maybe it was. I don't know. But the saying is, a woman is and a man must become. Right. Hmm. I think it sort of checks out. So okay. the one point I wanted to make earlier was this summer, someone was over, a couple people were over on the porch we were talking, and the the idea of toxic masculinity came up. And my point was that is completely unfair. It, it actually doesn't even check out. It makes no no sense. You have to account for a certain segment of society. A certain amount of people are assholes. Right. A lot of them are dudes, not all of them. So because a male happens to be an asshole, does that mean it's toxic masculinity? Right. Like the dude happens to be a man or a male and he's, he's a jerk. Like he, you know what I mean? He's are, an are asshole. Men not, so men that are does, but that doesn't necessarily, anyway. sure. But is that toxic masculinity or is it just that dude's an idiot? Right. Right. You see what I'm saying? 100%. But when we say it's toxic masculinity, then it sort of ties in that, look, there's a lot of, just a certain amount of people are crazy, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So 
but that shouldn't be a reflection on my masculinity or yours, right? Right. right. It seems unfair. Oh, I 100% agree. I mean, we have tied the idea of masculinity with toxic. You know, I, I mean, I think it's hard to, in today's society, not to, to disassociate the two, you know, mm-hmm. toxic and masculinity, you know, because we are, we have, you know, kind of all lumped those in together. Um, Can we talk about the role of struggle then in the human existence? And if we want to even narrow it closer to, the development of, of, uh, of a man, we could, because we're all dudes. Yeah. But I don't care what, you know, if we want to talk about, there is a role for struggle in the human existence. I don't care if you're male or female. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I think about where my mental state would be, if I did not go to the dim, gym and struggle every day, it would not be good at all. Like it would be, it would be quite bad. And the amount of times that I feel anxious, everything is wrong, um, frustrated. I think coffee actually like, because I don't eat breakfast. And so when you drink like two cups of coffee on an empty stomach, I start, I do. It does trigger sometimes. It triggers like anxiety and frustration. Mm -hmm. You feel like everything's wrong. And I'll go to the gym. And when I'm done at the gym, driving back to the office, somehow everything seems just fine. Right. Like the role of struggle, you cannot remove struggle from the human existence. I I think it's, it's impossible. So let's talk about that. How do you guys find struggling makes you a more developed, a more fuller person? And what types of struggling do you aim for or seek to incorporate into your life? Because you're going to have heart in your life. And I think the one theory is if you, do hard things by choice, then you're going to have less hard things happen to you. Yeah. Um, I, I think with that, I, I had a mentor of mine say one time, um, I, I, so first of all, I think as humans, we just desire to have comfortability. Like we're seeking comfort. Um, and comfortability can oftentimes, in my opinion, lead to, um, a lack of growth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so someone told me one time, comfortability isn't, it's not four walls that you kick against. It's like a rubber band. Like you, 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 you can call it struggling, um, fighting through something, you know, when you do that, it stretches that rubber band just a little bit farther in the sense that what used to look like something that was near impossible now seems normal and you push on to something greater. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and with that expands that rubber band, expands your horizons, expands, you know, how far you can go in certain areas. And so I think it's so necessary, um, for, for, for us as humans to, to, I, you know, to be honest with you, Ken, I don't really like the word struggle Mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, I, I, you know, discomfort or, you know, fighting, um, um, but, I don't think we need to struggle, but I think we do. I think it is good to, to, to put ourselves through hard things yeah. in order to um, experience, you know, first of all, whether that's for us or not. You know, I think of, um, you know, even just like right now with, with starting a business, um, you know, there's new things every day. And if you decide to just not do them, you're not going to ever grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, so it's totally necessary but I think it just comes from, I, I think a lack of growth comes from us just seeking comfortability. And that's what we want to do as humans is we want, we just want to be comfortable and comfortable just does not cause growth. Yep. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, just to go along with what you were saying there, I mean, I, I think it's definitely necessary, but I think it's something that, you know, I, I like to view that as, as what the mentor said about it's just not, it's not something that you can constantly are kicking against. It's just, it's a rubber band. It's a stretching you, it's growing you. It's, it's letting you see new things and understanding that, Hey, this, this is possible, you know, but you would have never known that if you didn't try it. Um, what is it about struggle you don't like? I don't necessarily disagree with you. I'm just curious to hear more on that. Well, I guess I'm kind of looking at it maybe from a spiritual aspect. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we need to, to struggle through things. Um, and I just, I, there's something about the word, you know, even just anxiety and stress. Like I stopped using stress. I stopped using the word stress. 
um, because I would say those things and, I, and, and just even just by me mentioning it or voicing that voicing struggle or voicing stress automatically threw me into a mindset sure. of just like, Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm behind, I'm behind the eight ball. I just, I, I'm just struggling, man. I, you know, I'm, and it, it just puts this mindset of just like me not being able to do it. I got you. Um, and so I think it's just a word for me. I, I, yeah. I don't necessarily say, I'm not saying it's a bad word or anything like that. You can't use it. I just, for me personally, I just don't like, I don't like the idea of that. And I don't like to have to like have that in the back of my mind. It's like, man, I'm just really struggling, yep. you know? I, I got I, you. But like uh, in terms of there's hard things to do and it's a challenge to get these hard things done. Like you would rather think of it more as like objective as opposed to like putting a tag on it, like a struggle. I, Is that what it's I'm a challenge. You say? I, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. I like the word challenge. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. it's a, it's a, yeah, I love that. It's not it's yep. not a struggle. It's a challenge, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. and so you're going to fail. You know, you may fail sometimes. Um, but that does, you know, and then you know what's going on. Then you know you can do it or you can't do it. It's not. It's a challenge that you take on, and and then you f- figure out whether it's for you or not. Yeah, I see um, what you're saying. Like if we were to say <clears throat> life is challenging, or we were to say life is a struggle. Yeah. Well, I'd much rather say life. Doesn't is Doesn't it paint a different picture? Hundred <laughs> percent, it does. And so for me personally, Absolutely. when I use that word struggle, it paints a different picture in my mind than challenge. Yep. Um, but but you know, okay, so so let's tie that into masculinity then. So, you know, I, I just finished the book wild at heart, John Eldridge. Um, and just, he, he describes, you know, just how, how God made us as men and how we desire, um, adventure and, and risk and, and all these things. Um, and so like, I just with that, like when I, when I take the word challenge, you know, as a man, that's something that you can rise to the occasion of. It's like, I, I rise to the occasion of taking on a challenge but when it's a struggle, it feels like, yeah. you know, it feels so like I'm, feeding. I'm just, yeah, mm-hmm. it feels like I'm limping from one victory to another. And it's right. like, no, I'm like, you know, I, I, you take on the challenge with your chest out, you know, with your, with your head up, mm-hmm. um, rather than a struggle just, just gives me the mental image of me limping from one thing to the next. No, I, you know I, I, I see what you're saying. I, I think the way that I look at struggle is, is a little bit differently. And, and I, I, I think. I don't look at struggle as a self-defeating thing. Okay. Like, you know, I think maybe you're saying like struggle, like it's just one bad thing after the next other thing. I think life needs to kick you in the ass from mm-hmm. time to time. I think well, it's every, going to, I oh, think, and no, it and it does. Yeah, and a hundred percent does. And I think, you know, if you, especially if you're growing, if you're not going through shit, you're not even attempting your limits, period. Right. And I, I think personally, it's good for men and boys and, and and men of all ages to come to the point where they're just like, "Damn, how the hell am I going to get on the other side of this?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. How am I going? I mean, I, I think you need to come to the point where you're like, "I don't see a way out." I think that is important. Okay, because I mean, if you always see a way out, you're never going to test yourself. Yeah, I do. I- Totally you know what I mean? Like to me, I mean, that's, that's the way that I view struggle is not like it's a constant defeating. And I, I see where you're coming from, but like, for me, it's not, a, it's not this idea of like this constant, like I'm never going to get out. It's just like right now, I, I mean, and there's been many, many, many times in my life. I look at it. I'm in a ton of shit and I'm like, I legit don't know if I'm going to make it on the other side. You know, I've been there in my marriage. I've been there in my business. I've been there with my kids. And I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to get out. Okay. So to me, it's this idea of like, okay, I'm in the middle of something. I've got to test who I am as a man. Mm-hmm. And I've got to figure out, and I've got to, I've got to not believe in myself. And when I come out on the other side and I prove to myself like, hey, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, you're going through things. But guess what? When you come out on the other side, you're like, yeah, I can do this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's almost this testing ground of like every time that that happens and every time that you get on a, on a, a bigger challenge and a bigger challenge and a bigger challenge and you don't know where you're at and you don't know how you're going to make it and then you do make it, it proves something within us that says there's really nothing that I can't overcome. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing like, like right now my 18-month-old or not 18 months, my five month old. I don't know. I think I'm thinking of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me off. But, you know, he's trying to crawl, right? You know, and he's like, he's like doing this wiggle thing of trying to pull his knees up. And I just, I want to grab his knees and I want to push the knees up and say, this is how you crawl. Right. 
But if I do that, mm-hmm. I'm going to fuck him up. Because mm-hmm. he's not going to learn. Yep. He, like need, a, he needs to get pissed as a five-month-old. Yep. He needs to be like, I can't figure this out. You know, because eventually when he does figure it out, he's going to be proud of himself. Yeah, totally. And there's something about life that requires that struggle. Like the, uh, I don't even know if this is true, but I've heard before, if you help a little chick hatch out of its egg, that that chick will not be as strong or may die. Right. Again, I don't know if that's true, but it sort of makes sense. I know the butterfly does. For sure. Really? You cut cut open the cocoon. You know, like, like the, the, you know, I mean, that's a popular analogy, but like they have to force themselves through that little cocoon to, mm-hmm. to, to, because it forces their blood in certain ways to different parts of their bodies. Mm-hmm. You cut open that cocoon that to let them out, it dies. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what we're talking you about. You know, same thing. So, what hard things do you guys incorporate into your life on purpose to further develop you as a human? Because we're talking, you know, I mean, we're talking a little bit in theory, so let's make it practical. I mean, the physical attributes, I think, is hey, one pull, of the easiest pull, yeah, ways pull to, that mic real close. to really test yourself. Um, I think going into the gym every day, being humbled and realizing what your capabilities are, but showing up every day to, to pursue that honestly makes me better at work. Because you're going to deal with people, uh, with situations that are going to be difficult and challenging. And a lot of times you just want to throw in the towel because it's like, oh, my goodness, I don't want to deal with this. But, you know, when it's your livelihood at stake, it's like, okay, I know that I can get through this. Mm -hmm. I know that I can think about this. I can make a plan because I've struggled through these other things. And I can apply that logic, that approach, that mindset, and I will get through this and Mm -hmm. conquer it. Right. Um I think it's very wise for all people to put themselves in hard situations so that they can learn those skill sets, you know, and, um, you know, from the masculinity side, I I don't have any sons, but I do think, you know, for the fathers that have young boys in today's day and age, that's a huge task. Um, Having a daughter, I feel I have to become I have to evolve into the spitting image that she will then take into the world at, at you know, whatever age she becomes and, and look for a partner. Mm-hmm. And so the version of masculinity that may be tossed around in today's day and age, in my opinion, is irrelevant. The one that I have to embody is the one that matters day in, day out, so that my daughter can learn what that looks like mm-hmm. and reflect good. And, and search for that elsewhere. Okay. If not, I mean, I think that's, you know, and I'm definitely not there. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to have an amazing wife to help me navigate that and, and understand what that masculinity needs to look like. Because mm-hmm. it, the toxic masculinity, I, that term is definitely incorrectly used, but I do think there are toxic males. Oh, one hundred percent, and they are definitely one hundred percent ruining it. There's so <laughs> many for for everyone, right? right? Um, and because of those individuals, I think the identity of masculinity has become so perverse that it, it's making it a, a a challenge for us to to stand tall as men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, dude. That that's okay. So you're saying you're seeking to be the man that you would like your daughter, you would like your daughter to learn from so that she partners with a, a real man one day. Correct. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, look, <clears throat> I've not been shy before on like giving my opinions on CrossFit on this podcast before I am, I understand if it's not for everybody or there's not a gym nearby. Actually, that's a big, that's a huge thing, a huge thing. And then all, not all the gyms are made equal. Oh, yeah. like there was just Absolutely. someone at a gym today who owned it there. They owned a gym in California for 10 years and then they moved here three years ago and they're not liking the gyms that they were at. And she's been at our gym for three months. And so we'll see, but she's liking it so far. I think our gym is fantastic. Mm-hmm. But before we moved to Nashville, I'd never, I didn't even know what CrossFit was and never went to a CrossFit gym because there was none. So I understand there's a lot of people that don't have access to a good, 
or any CrossFit gym, let alone a good one. So I totally get that. But there's something about the CrossFit workout that's just different than going to Planet Fitness and screwing around for an hour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the community. Yeah, and the community. Yes, 100% on that. Yeah, there was a dude I was talking to a couple years ago. <clears throat> he was single male, and he was looking for community. And I, I, I think that, you know, going to the gym every day as a dude is really, really good for you. I think there's, like, a lot of benefits to that. Mm-hmm. Mentally, physically, I mean, psychologically, like, all, go on down the list. And I was like, man, have you ever thought about joining a CrossFit gym? And he was like, well, yeah, I go to Planet Fitness, you know, every so often. And, like... You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But the thing that I was like, we're not even talking about the same thing. You know, I understand you can get community at a Planet Fitness, yeah. probably, I assume. But it's not, statistically, you don't get community at a gym like a Planet Fitness like you do at a CrossFit gym. You just don't. Um, there's something about, like, showing up at a particular class time, doing functional fitness, high intensity, constantly varied movements with the same people, three, four, five days a week that um, where you get that, you get community. Like you don't, you don't get that yeah. just doing anything with anyone randomly. Part of that um, though is to the shared struggle. Yes. So I wanted to get, yeah. yes. Football teams, agree. two a days, you bond with those people because you see them at the lowest of That's the right, lowest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you also see them at the highest of highest and everything in between. Mm-hmm. Yep. CrossFit is, is a, a phenomenal opportunity. I mean, it took me years to get my wife to go. And finally, she came on like a Saturday class and literally, I say seven years of telling her to come. Oh, yeah. And finally, she came and I told all the girls, I'm like, hey, my wife's coming, you know, be extra nice. Yeah. And she (laughs) fell in love with them. Oh, yeah. Like they were really great. And we ended up having a great community with them. But from the male perspective, it was an amazing opportunity to be there with complete strangers, moms, dads, single guys, you know, various facets of life, all present and everyone showing up and just struggling. And that to me was what really bonded a lot of us is that I saw you almost die yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Here you are again today. <laughs> exactly. Like, there, the one thing I want to say on that too is it doesn't matter if it's a three minute workout or if it's a 40 minute workout. Uh, there's something about the way these workouts are designed and with the classes and the built-in competitiveness. I mean, I think first and foremost, when I go to the gym, I'm competing against myself. Mm-hmm. But if you're there and I feel like we're, we track somewhat similar, like it just has an effect. You know what I mean? It just has an effect. I think people shouldn't get too overly concerned with that because I feel like the people that are too overly concerned with competing, just going to the gym every day with those around them, they burn out. Oh yeah. For like, sure. So you can't get too caught up in that, but it absolutely has an effect. And it doesn't matter if it's a seven, three minute workout, seven minute workout or 40 minute workout. But I think it's particularly noticeable in the 40 minute workouts is, and this is how like any project goes. This is how life goes. Sometimes is you get started, you're excited, you pace yourself. And then somewhere in the middle, it's like, shoot, I don't know if I can finish this. And what you do is you just keep moving and you use what you got. So maybe the last time you did this workout quicker, maybe this time it takes a little bit longer, but you use what you got. You keep pushing Slow down if you have to. It doesn't matter. Just one foot in front of the other. Just keep moving. And the thing about these long workouts, they always end. And you're laying on the floor, you know, begging for your life, basically. But, like, going through that going through that cycle of, like, nervousness, and then you get into it, and it's like, oh, shoot, I don't know if I can hang on. And then you just keep moving. And guess what? It always seems to, like, you always get through. Uh, just don't quit like that's my number one I mean I have I have quit before on workouts if like I I feel an injury coming on or whatever like I'm I sure. I, I, I will totally but so many times I'm into workout and I'm and I'm thinking to myself well are you gonna quit well are you a quitter I'd like to think I'm not so why are you thinking about quitting pace whatever you got to pace and you freaking keep going because you're not a quitter so keep going and I feel like that experience like translates into writing a thesis, writing a, a book, doing a project at work, um, raising kids sometimes. Like it just, it translates into all of life. Just that idea that just keep moving. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's all you can do is just keep moving and then you, you will get through. It's like you were saying before, like having these times in life, where you don't know how you're going to get through. 
the important thing is that you just keep moving. Yeah. You get through it. I was, I would used to say, you know, I, I don't do CrossFit anymore because I, the, my schedule just wouldn't allow me to do it. But I, I do <laughs> do what? I know. I could do it now. You're talking to the no, two let's be honest. You're so rich now. You have excuse. a personal trainer. That's the real. But reason. I used to, I used to say that nothing unites people like sports and tragedy, mm-hmm. and CrossFit gives you both. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> and like like you said, the idea of like everybody being at the end of the workout saying it sucks. You know, the people coming in like you're gonna hate it. Mm-hmm. You know, there is that sense of community, and I will say that is the one thing that I miss about it mm-hmm. is is the people, and you do grow to, you do grow to love the people you struggle with. Um, but again, mm-hmm. this all goes back to this idea of like fighting and 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 struggling, and you know, doing it within a community setting. I also think that it's one of our big missteps as guys in today's society is we're not doing that together. We're not struggling together, right? Like we're not, yes. we're not, we're, we're isolating ourselves to a point where we're not seeking the community of other guys um, hmm. to, to grow that masculinity within ourselves. Yeah. And I think okay. the illusion too of let's hang out and get drunk has replaced what that should be, what it should actually be. Right. Of that struggle. It's, okay, well, we're still hanging out. We can still grow, but not really. I mean, you know, pushing yourself in, in situations to do hard things. You know, our coach would always tell us, you know, adjust the weight as you need to. Don't overdo it. And me and a couple guys would always look at each other and say, RX or die. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd always, we'd look at our coach and be like, how long does this workout? It's like 10 minutes. So pick the weight accordingly. And I'm like, Nah, I'm going to do the RX way, and it may take me 11, but I'm going to get through it. And for me, pushing myself in in, in those type of examples, I mean, I, I knew I would come in last, but I'd always feel like I was able to do that. Mm-hmm. And tomorrow, I'm going to show up. And, and I think that's half the battle, too, with, with, with men. We, we don't show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. part of that is either – we find it too easy or for whatever reasons, but I felt like that the struggle is r- always brought me back. You know, the challenge, if you will, it was always, to, I'm coming back because yesterday I was surprised myself on what I was able to do mm-hmm. today. I want to do better. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, to that point about sharing experiences with other dudes. Actually, you, you mentioning getting drunk at a bar together is a really good example. And it's making me think, that is the easiest I'm I literally just had this thought so let me know if this is wrong or whatever but it struck it's occurring to me now that that's the easiest way to get together in society and have a shared experience with other dudes is at the bar mm-hmm. like it's the most socially acceptable it's the most common it's it's like there's a category for that it's easy for it's, it's easy well, I mean, it's yeah, easy exactly but right. that's what I was going to say but because I've been thinking about, I have thought about this a, a fair bit. We were watching um, the TV show uh, Seal Team like a year ago. Mm-hmm. We we're watching a whole book. We kind of got hooked on it and just were like watching so much of it. And there's a lot in there that I envy. You know, like this is, these dudes are doing life together. They're not just going on missions together. They're doing life together. You know, if someone has a birthday, they're having a barbecue and everyone's at that barbecue. If someone has a kid, they're having another barbecue and they're all at that barbecue. You (laughs) know what I mean? And then they go on mission together and they're doing life together. Now I I don't, I'm not going to become a seal, but it seems like an area that is potentially missing in our society, like to get together and like have a brotherhood. It's, Right. Harder now. Well, I mean, I think it's because we live in easy times. I mean, going back to this idea of easy times, like think about a thousand years ago. If you were a man, you know, you were likely to what? Go off to war for six months. Mm-hmm. You know, you were likely to do this. I mean, the fact of like us as a community having to come together, whether it be fighting or growing crops or building a community or whatever it may be, it was necessary for survival. Like you could literally live in your basement in order to go today completely, utterly isolated and yeah. still physically survive. Exactly. You could not do that a thousand years ago. Yes. And you wonder why there's 
right? Men make up 80% of suicides. Yeah, I mean, like, mm. right, like, like you're talking about technology. Technology has allowed us to isolate ourselves as men to where we don't have to go off to war. I mean, we have to artificially create challenge. We have to artificially create. So, like, we have to go and pay somebody for the privilege to work out somewhere. Right. Like, like we have to pay to have struggle today or challenge, however you want to put it. Like we have to, we have to go to the gym. If we want to work out our bodies, we don't have to go work the fields. We don't have to go chop down trees. We don't have to go cut firewood. Like what used to be necessary and was part of our biology and what was part of everyday society that kind of like, that's what we're like actually built to do is no longer necessary for survival. Mm -hmm. So now we have to intentionally go out and create scenarios in our life to replicate that same experience that all men had before us. Yep. Mm -hmm. And not just shared experiences, but rituals too. Like I think, I, I don't know why this is, but I think a lot of how life worked on this continent before we got here, like with the native Americans, you know, and, I'm look, I mean, they were fighting for their life most of the time. So I'm sure it's, you, you can overly romanticize it way too quickly. But the way that worked was you like were a boy and then you got initiated into becoming a man. And then you did man stuff with other men in your tribe, mm -hmm. whether that was going to fight a war or going out to kill something to bring it back home or hunting, whatever it was. But you, it, it was very tribal. Mm. Like you did stuff with other men in your tribe and that it's not how it is anymore it seems like do you guys think it is easier in today's society for women to have community than men i think it's more socially acceptable yeah i mean uh, no i mean think about this i mean you know women have quote-unquote girlfriends and they can go out and they can do the spa things like most men do that you you have to you have to go out like I was joking around. I don't know if it was who it was. I think it was my brother. Actually, we were kind of joking around because we went to had to go shopping for something. We had to go buy something, and we're walking through like Target, right? Two dudes walking through Target, and we was joking around saying, "We're not gay. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're not gay, right?" I mean, I'm sorry. You kind of have to. You kind of have to. Kind of yelling into the mic here, but yeah. you you know what I mean? Like, and like, we didn't say it, but we were laughing you feel about the need. Yep. You feel the need yep. to say like, "Hey, this is not a this is not a homosexual relationship here. Right. We're just two guys together walking through Target." Yep. <laughs> you know, and I mean, to me, that what does that say about our, our you know what society has done? I mean, I, I think you were talking about like. How, how high suicides are amongst men. Um, I, I think that is for that reason. I mean, I think it's a lot easier for women to come and together. And, and I, again, unless guys are coming together to, to watch football, to drink beer. Yeah. An observation I made a, a couple of years ago that I brought up to my, my wife was because I, I have hobbies. I have close guy friends in those hobbies that I like to spend time with and do these things. And there's always a, a balance that I have to maintain of um, how much of this is taking away from my family life, right? And so one of the things that I, I brought up to her was if you look at the, our fathers who are both living, how many of them have very close male relationships? My father, I can tell you it's, it's, it's zero. There's right. no guy that he calls up to talk uh, and see how they're doing. Um, you know, he's and what and what's even sad about that, and I love my father, but he's an active member at his church. Mm. But he he will never, you know, he's in his sixty three now. He doesn't go out with a good friend to talk. And, and that's very lonely for me to kind of see that. And I tell my wife, I'm like, look, that's why I invest in these men and these specific individuals. Um, why, and yes, we, it, we do have a hobby that we share common ground with. And, you know, her response is also to, um, you know, why aren't these guys the guys from, from church, right? And I told her, you know, it, it's hard for me to go to a small group setting and we're expected to sit here and bond because that's not the way that I bond with other men is sitting here reading and um, expressing our feelings. I have m closer friendships. Um, yes, a lot of them are Christian men, but it, it's surrounded around struggle. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of the challenges, whether it's we taking hunting trips together, which just us in the backwoods. Um, it's guys that I went to college with and we struggled with um, just trying to be good Christian guys during college, right? And living that out. And I think at the end of the day, you know, when we're looking at all these this ideas of what masculine men look like and, and the conversations, the relationships that we need to have, it, it's very important for us, one, to ensure that we're following the straight and narrow path, right, to hold each other accountable. Because um, without those relationships, if I can't ask you those hard personal questions, who will? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm actually really glad you said that because I have wondered, sometimes I have wondered what is wrong with me to the extent that I can't bond over, um, like, well, your example is a good one, a small group or a Bible study or something like that. Like, for me, naturally, okay, naturally, maybe I'm not supposed to say this out loud, but particularly because I work at church, but um, I have found it easier to naturally bond with the dudes at my CrossFit class than I have with just random dudes at church. But that would make sense if there's something in a man that needs that bonding to happen over activity, because I've also heard this in the past where, <clears throat> um, you, you know, like I think of the time that I spent with my dad, he died when I was 10 from cancer, but I have memories of him, great memories. And I feel like I spent a lot of time with him. But when I think about what we were doing, he was bringing me along when he was doing something. We weren't sitting across the table, you know, sipping tea or, or whatever, um, or having a snack. I mean, I'm sure we did plenty of that, but I don't remember that. Right. I remember doing stuff with him. So there's something mm-hmm. about a man that you bond over in activity, whether that's right. going to the gym or hunting. You know, I think your examples are, are good ones. Yeah. That makes you, sense. When you said about women almost having like a more of a, or an easier path to community than men, I think a lot of that has to do with just like, guys being willing to be vulnerable with each other to a point of just sharing things that are hard that we all struggle with, but we all think we're going, we're the only ones going through it because we never share it with anybody. We never share it with each other. And I don't know if that's because we want to keep this macho, like, you know, um, image of what, you know, what a, what a masculine man is supposed to look like. I don't know if it's, it's because of that or not, but I feel like, the, the vulnerability um, also is a big bonding thing between men because it there's something that there, there's certain things that I can't I, I can try to explain them to my wife, but she just doesn't she she will not understand it the same way you might mm-hmm. because you th- you you think the same way I do. You know, there's there's certain things that we we all like I said, we all struggle with with certain things, but like we need each other to like fight through those things to, to work them out to, you know, it might not be physically working out, but like, man, prayer together, you know, get getting in the, you know, creating a war room with each other where we can just, just fight with each other. But that takes vulnerability and that is really freaking hard Yeah, I know um, that, I know that. for, for a man. And, and I don't know where that came from, but that's, um, where that started, but it's just, uh, I mean, I think that's why it's a little easier for women to have that community than it is for males. Well, I think it's partly because we are so pack driven, like it's in our blood. Um, whether it's from, you know, a, a God initiated evolution or just the way we're created, but the pack is in our blood. We don't want to get cut out from the pack. Yeah. So if you share too much, too openly, too quickly, and you thought you could trust these guys, but it turns out yeah. you can't trust them, and they yep. cut you out from the pack. That's like the worst thing. Yep. It's so funny, dude, because I have done this myself at our gym, and I have seen, literally seen two other guys do it. And when I saw them, it triggered in my mind, like, that's what's happening right now. So over the last two years, I blew my back out like six times. And like so bad, I can barely walk. And so, of course, you know, at some point after a week or two, you find your way back into the gym just to ride the bike or whatever. And every single time when I'm injured, I will come into the gym. First of all, you walk a little di- what, different because not just cause you're injured, but because like you feel injured, you know what I mean? Like mentally. And I will like 
come in and find my way around the side of the gym and go into the back corner and do something back there. And all of the dudes that get injured do the same thing. It's right. like they're, it's like they're, it's like a wolf in a wolf pack that's injured. That's it's like they sneak around the side and like go do their thing and just try to get healthy as quick as possible so they can rejoin the pack. Right. It's it's yeah. kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, because I do think that, that is, is that is a built in thing. Like we, I think deep down we know that we can't do this on our own. Yeah. And we're not supposed to, and it's not going to work to do it on our own. Like we bear too much responsibility. If you're, if you are a dude paying attention, trying to like actually make life better for those you love, you bear a lot of responsibility. Yeah. I think this doesn't get talked about very much and it's fine. You know, we're, we're strong. We'll push through it. We don't, you know, whatever. It just is the way it is, but we bear a lot of responsibility. It doesn't get talked about. And we know deep down, there's no way we're going to be able to like pull through on this responsibility without some other dudes helping mm-hmm. us, whether it's a dad or a grandpa or a friend or whatever it is. So if you, get vulnerable too quickly and they cut you out from the pack. That's like, it's like it affects you at like an inner psychological level. Like you can't let that happen. Yeah. I think that's partly why it's hard for us to be vulnerable because I feel like f- women that can absolutely happen. Absolutely. I just feel like it's a little harder for it to happen. I would, yeah. I would also say too, um, from a father son relationship, you know, speaking personally, I, I can't remember of a time where my dad, was vulnerable with me oh, yeah. or, yeah. I, or, or encouraged me mm-hmm. to be vulnerable. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I, you know, at my 35 years of life, it is not something that I've right learned how to do. And so for me it, to be vulnerable, which I've, I've been to blessed to have a, a couple core friends that I can be vulnerable that with. Well. And that, well. that really is something that I think a lot of us miss out on is oh, 100%. how to be vulnerable with one another and being being taught that in a, in a very safe environment. Yeah. Oh, I mean, for me, you know, yeah. with, with my they're dad. Yeah, they're both well, Weller. Are you, are you talking about Red I'm Label? or sorry. Come on, come on, there's more than one. I've had this one before, and I know it's really good. So. <laughs> so I, I was going to say, to Kent's point, too, one other aspect of the, you know, the, the wounded wolf going around the, the gym and just kind of part of that, too, I think, is that we just don't know how to be able to say that I'm hurt. Yeah. Like yes, that's, yes, yeah. that's a good. Dude, point. I, that's so true. I've, I've never, I mean, and, and again, this is nothing against my father. It's a really love him. I have a great relationship with him, but I, I've never was taught how to ask for help. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, I had a, a very close friend group and we ended up having one, one of our buddies go through a very tough marital issue and it caught us all by surprise. And we're here. We are. We got a text thread. We 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 check in with each other, and I remember pulling a couple of my buddies to the side. I'm like, I think we failed them. Hmm. Well, like, h- how is it that we've been this close for so long and none of us saw this happen? Yeah. Or better yet, we we kind of joked about like things that were obviously red flags, but no one ever sat down with him to be able to say, "Hey, bud, like, what's going on here?" Mm-hmm. Right. And I think a lot of that is if we're not taught early on to be vulnerable, to be able to ask for help, it carries on and it can be dire consequences for us as men Mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the toxic behavior can come from is that, you know, be quiet, don't say anything, you know, just push onward, which is, you know, one approach. Right. But it is one approach and it creates a lot of hurt. Mm -hmm. And it creates a lot of hurt. Like let's, let's drive to the closest sort of, um, ghetto area of Nashville and dude so much hurt there's so much hurt there like you can't tell me these dudes these dudes are hurting yeah they're hurting I think there's a lot of dudes just walking around with a ton of hurt that just you can't talk about it push on and then it and then it causes you to do dumb stuff yeah I for me you know with my dad I I I had a very, very fractured, and I think Kent and I talked about this on a podcast a long time ago, but I, I had a very fractured relationship with my dad. You know, he was, his dad was not affectionate at all. And it's, and it's very difficult to show affection when you've never really received affection. And I think for me, you know, my natural response in life and as a whole is when, I get pissed at somebody, I just cut them out of my life. 
like done. You're out of my life. Fuck you. Are you good at that? I'm very good at that. Bro, I bet you're not as good as I am. <laughs> I've uh, I I've cut I've, clo- I've closed companies in seven days. I mean, <laughs> I'm well, I'm closing a I'm closing a million dollar company right now in a month, right? So I mean, you know, I I'm a I like I, I'll tell you this. Yeah, but that's one thing. But cutting people out though is a different thing. Well, I cut. I'm out, not saying you're not good at I'll, it. I I'll cut. I cut. Are. I'll say this. I'll say I'm this, and saying, I'm not I'm, proud of I'm it. Also- but <laughs> I cut out my dad between 19 to 25. He lived, I could take a, a golf club and hit a golf, hit his house. Seven iron. Between, seven yeah, iron. Seven, I could take almost a seven iron, maybe a little more than a seven iron. You already established before the mic and, is on that yeah, all you use when you golf is a seven iron. That is true. Hook that bad boy. Seven iron and a putter. <laughs> and I, I saw him only when I had to on Christmas, right? That was it. And, I mean, you know, I, I was talking and, you know, as, as time got healing and all this stuff and – I remember talking to my therapist about it because I'm huge into therapy. I believe, I'm a full, full believer in that. But, you know, they were, we were talking about it. And, you know, I've never also, like, I don't, I've never had a real conversation with him. Maybe one time and it lasted like three minutes. And, and I was like, you know, I don't, I would be surprised if he's ever had a real conversation with somebody in his life. Wow. Like ever. Like wow. ever, like, you know, I've been privileged, you know, Kent and I have been able to have a lot of times where we go out, smoke cigars and have good, good conversation. But like it, it made it, you know, as I got older, I, I understood it. You know, I understood like I get you were broken. I'm broken. You were broken. You handled it differently than I handled it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, not better. Just we handled it differently. And, you know, I remember and not a lot of people know this. I don't, you know. And I don't really care to talk about it, but, you know, I wrote my dad a letter about six, nine months ago. I don't remember how long it was. And I was just elderly, you know, like, cause he came to me and he's like, Hey, and it was one of those weird times. And he was like, Hey, do you remember that time? And I remembered it vividly. And it was the time that I cut him out of my life. Hmm. Like I was mad about something. I heard about something and just like, boom, I'm like, You're, I'm done with you. And that was when I cut him out completely. And he brought it up, and he's like, "Do you remember that?" And I said, "Nope, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. What, what are you talking about? I don't know." And I knew exactly what he was talking about, and I lied about it. And I didn't lie about it because I didn't want to talk about it as much as I didn't want to fracture this kind of repaired relationship that I'd started to have with him. Like, like mm-hmm. we're in a good place now. And I'm like, this is this was the cat, and the, the you know what is it, the, the the straw that broke the camel's back that I lost so many years and I wrote him a letter and I, and I kind of started off with like, look, you know, here's the thing. And this is how I was feeling. And I just wanted you to be there for me and all this stuff. And I just wrote this real, just long, honest letter to him. Um, and I gave it to him and I was shaken. Like I, I almost did it. Like I, it was at my grandpa's funeral and I'm like, Hey, uh, by the way, uh, I wrote you something here. Maybe you can read one you by yourself. You know, but even to this day, he's never brought up the fact that I gave him that letter. Oh, hmm. so you gave him this letter six or nine months ago, and he's never brought it up. Yeah, it may be a year. I don't remember how long hmm. it's been, but like he's never brought it up. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean, like again, like how do you have that conversation with with someone? And and I, you know, and to me, to me, it just kind of speaks to that. You know, we need someone to show us. Like you can work through things. You can be vulnerable. You know, sometimes it takes like you got to be that first person. I, I hope that one day we can talk about it. You know, I don't yeah. want to push him. But, you know, you it think just. you will? I hope so, but I'm nervous as hell to talk about it. But really? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm nervous just because I know it's going to put him in an awkward situation. Do you think that writing the letter and getting no response was still better than not writing the letter? hundred percent. Really? I, I went into it. I went into it like, hey. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming you. I'm not, you know, I love you. And I remember, I remember writing the letters like, look, I know you loved me. I just didn't see it at the time. Mm. You know, it's like, I know you cared for me in the best way that you knew how. It's like, I was just hurt. I was hurt from the divorce. I was hurt from, I wanted you to be there and you just not feeling like you was, you know, I'm like, but I love you and I forgive you and I'm sorry in my part for the fractured and the lost years, I'm sorry that I, my pride got in the way that I couldn't just come and talk about it. And, and I, and I, I hoped for a response, but I was like, you know, I don't need it. Mm-hmm. 
because I just wanted to say I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for my part of this. And, you know, I think that, I think it's important for us to model to our kids, like, it's okay to say I'm sorry. It's okay to be vulnerable. So, you know, it's like, it's okay to to do these things and it doesn't attack your masculinity. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's it okay to say I love you. It's okay to say I love you. Yeah. You know, it's okay to say I love you. It's okay to say I'm sorry. It's okay. It's, it's good to say okay to say I was wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's it can be really hard to do. Mm-hmm. The not being present thing is something that I have currently a lot of fear around in my parenting because it's shocking to me how easy it is for me to not be present hmm. with my kids. It's, it's pretty disturbing actually. Like it is crazy easy to come home from work and then they're out running around playing or whatever and, you know, say hi. And I, my, my issue with my kids is not a lack of physical touch. I love to hug him and all that. So, and then they're, they're out running around. Um, and then at some point you're grabbing dinner and at some point you're trying to get everyone their bedtime snack and get their teeth brushed and get them to bed. And like, you can do all that and not be in the same space with them. 100%. You can do yeah. all that very, wow. very easily and not be in the same headspace with them. And I have noticed multiple times recently where it goes days where I did not connect with any of these kids. Like, actually connect with them just for a second. It's so, and I'm really, really concerned about that because this guy, uh, Chamath, I will not be able to pronounce his last name. He's on the all in podcast that you turned me on to. Chamath Papatia. Chamath Papatia. By the way, this all in podcast is freaking awesome, dude. Coat, you mentioned it many times. And the thing is like, you know, I'm 38 now. And after 30, I really decided that I was going to like, um, narrow who I was learning from because you just get to a point where like you, you can't just keep like being open to the latest and greatest thing. Like you got to just kind of pick where you want to learn from and kind of stick with that and go deeper with them. And so like, I almost never listen to new podcasts now. Um, Pauli Papatia, by the way. What is it? Pauli Papatia. Off a little bit. <laughs> oh, Chamath Pauli Papatia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> He's been telling me about this all in podcast and I'm like, yeah, I don't listen to new podcasts anymore. And, but I started listening to it and it's actually really awesome. I think they're around episode a hundred. Yeah. Over that. Mm-hmm. Over a hundred. Mm-hmm. It's basically four billionaires that get on a podcast every Saturday and they just join via zoom. And it's, I'm really, really enjoying it. Anyhow, this dude Chamath is from India, I think. And his dad beat him. It's terrible. Uh, and he, carries through now in life a sense of worthlessness because his dad beat him. Yes, that's one thing, but also just wasn't present. Hmm. And so that was interesting to me. And I was Googling a little bit around that. And cause I, I struggle with a sense of worthlessness from time to time. And I'm really embarrassed to like, I'm embarrassed about it. I really, I really am. Like, I don't like to, I don't ever really say that to someone. There's something about being on the mics with headphones in a trusted company. <laughs> you literally tell the, the bros. Whole, you tell the whole world stuff that you wouldn't like, you know, just tell the, any anyone. But um, so I was, I was, you know, but if it's like this billionaire who is saying he still to this day struggles with a sense of worthlessness. When he says that, that to me, like gives me more empathy and compassion for myself and like more, well, let's. If I feel that way, then maybe it's okay to talk about that too from with trusted people, you know? But anyhow, that sense comes can come from parents being um, not present. And in my case, that is not the case because I feel like my mom was very present. I really feel like my mom raised us very well as a single parent. Um, so I don't know exactly where it comes. It can also come from a death. Like it's like it was an unexpected surprise. It's you can almost feel like, well, yeah, but I was never good enough to have a dad anyway. Like it can come right. from come from a lot of different things. But I am I'm actually quite concerned about passing on a sense of worthlessness to my kids because of my lack of presence. Mm. So what do you feel causes the la- like when you say that? Like what do you 
What do you mean by or what what causes that? Do you think or what, how? What do you feel? Is it just so much going on in life that it's hard to like slow down and take that time? Or no, I can don't you expound think, on that a little bit. Yeah, totally. I don't think it comes from busyness. I think that um, it probably comes from. I think in my case, it comes from a sense of lack of respect for myself. Hmm. Uh, like, like a lack of, uh, uh, yeah, a lack of respect for myself, thinking that I'm underperforming in general in life and sort of a, a low grade frustration and disappointment, I think in, in your own self. Hmm. Um, and, and I think that can, that, that can certainly cause it. I think if someone is like highly, highly anxious or they they are like deeply depressed, it can cause that. But I don't think that, you know, because I'm only talking about like sharing a moment. So this is not about time. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe if you're really busy and you're just distracted, it could also cause that. But I'm only talking about like um, sharing a moment with them. So that's something that I've been paying attention to is that lack of presence. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really concerned that I'm going to instill some sort of worthless sense of worthlessness in my kids because of how unpresent. Right. It's easy for me to be unpresent. It really is. Yeah. Oh, I I think at least for me as a, as a dad, I'm, it's the same way, and and it, ha- it has nothing to do with time because I may be sitting there in the living room with all three of my boys. And Jax or Finley will be like, hey, dad, let's play. And I'll be like, ah, maybe later. Like, there's no reason other than it's going to take work. I mean, and I know it sounds, it sounds weird to say it's work to be, but it, it, there's times when you've had a hard day or you may have X, Y, or Z happening in your life. And to stop and say, I'm going to be fully present in my child's life and what they're interested in. You just want to be selfish. You just, I, for me, I just I just want to be selfish, and I just want to veg out on some football or whatever it may be. Um, it 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 is it, that at least for me is can be a struggle mm-hmm. of and once I get into it and I, I spend time and I do that. It, it's amazing too how little it actually takes for children to feel like you're present. Right. Oh, it takes yeah. takes very like yeah. other day Finley was like, Can we snuggle? And he's like a horse. He's like jumps up in my lap. He's again we talked about he's a hundred pounds. How he old j- is he again? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> he jumps on him like <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like I'm holding him like this. <laughs> this massive man child. You know, but again, he's Ferdinand. He's a lover. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. he's a physical touch guy. Mm-hmm. And so I, the other day he was just sitting in my lap and I was just holding him and I was like stroking his hair or, you know, something like that. Nothing huge. And we were just talking about dumb mundane stuff, his transformers or whatever it was. And he came to me and said, dad, thanks for snuggling with me. Wow. That's cool. That's cool. You know? And I mean, to me, it was just such a small thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't really think much about it, yep. but to him, it was the world, mm-hmm. you know? And like, in that moment, I, w- I was tempted to be like, ah, dude, you can't sit in my lap. You're getting so freaking big. Mm-hmm. But to him, it just meant so much. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it feels like it's going to take so much out of us to be present, but it takes really so little to give them what wow. they need. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you do, why did you get into jujitsu? Is that another thing you wanted to get into to do a hard thing? Ooh, this is, this can be long winded. I'll try not to. <clears throat> it's a, a tool that I want to add to my toolbox in my ever growing path of being a, a capable citizen. And so um, it's something that I notice that it, I, I, I take the responsibility of being the protector of my, my wife and my daughter seriously enough to believe that I shouldn't assume that someone else will come to my fight and be willing to die for me in my stay, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't feel that that is a mindset that I should have, that a police officer will arrive in my moment of need and do what they need to to resolve the situation. Um, so part of it is 
that's just a piece of a toolbox that I've been creating um, that I needed to be a well-rounded individual to be able to handle the situations. Mm -hmm. Um, Apart from there is I hope that my daughter, as she grows, it will be something that she can then pick up and I can do with her. Um, Working out is great, and I hope my daughter will be active and I will instill physical activity being something that she needs to do just from a, a health and wellness standpoint. But from a defensive and protective state, I want her to be able to learn some skills. And if daddy does it, and maybe she'll be more inclined to do it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, at, at 35, the class that I go to, the average age is probably 40. There's a couple of young guys in there. Um, but all of them, well, not all of them, but most of them have young little ones that they wanted their kids to learn. And the way they got them to learn was, oh, daddy's doing this. Mm-hmm. I want to follow in those footsteps, right? So being that leader, being that example, right? Kids are very visual. And so I, that's just ultimately want to be really good at being able to handle myself in a situation um, and hopefully embody something that my daughter will want to emulate as well. How long do you see yourself training? What are you, two or three days a week right now? It, it varies. Um, this month with us going to be traveling at the last two weeks of the month, I, I try to go every day. But yeah, okay. on, on average, three, four times a week um, at lunch. Oh, on average, three to four times a week. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see yourself doing this for three to four times a week, two years more, five years more, 20 years? Um, as long as I can. I mean, I, okay. I, I started CrossFit when I was in it was 2009. And really switched to jujitsu in 20, uh, 2021. Okay. Pretty much just transitioned over. And, and so for me, it was more of, I got to a point in CrossFit where it was, why am I doing this? Like, what's the, the end goal for, for me? Is it to achieve uh, this squat? And if so, why? Mm-hmm. Like, how is it making me a better man, a better husband, a better father, whatever, right? Like, for me, there has to be an end state that I'm trying to achieve. And ultimately what it did was instill the foundation for me to have a solid f- basis of physical fitness mm-hmm. to then use to leverage on other endeavors. So for jiu-jitsu, it's, I hope to be able to do it as long as I can. Okay. Yep. I was, um, I mean, I just started two weeks ago. So, but it's something that I have been, wanting to do for a couple of years, a few years, really. And I wanted to do something that was going to kick my butt. And it totally is Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's going to take me a while, dude. I mean, I'm just basically, I'm not that smart. So when they like teach a movement, I need to like, it takes a bit, you know? So I feel like I'm going to be a very slow learner at this. And so it's kicking my butt, which was part of the reason that I wanted to do it. And I also wanted to be beaten physically by another dude or girl and lady, um, another human, like be physically beaten in a way that it doesn't matter. You know, like it's fine to get tapped out. It's just they know more than you do. They're more technical than you do. They know better moves than you do. Um, That's fine. So it but to be humbled in that way but then also to experience the exhilaration of tapping someone else out and learning and just that huge like growth curve, but also the physical, the physicalness of it. One thing I was thinking of recently was, I mean, I didn't think about this for a long time, but when I was a kid and my dad's family would get together the laps, I mean, I'll bet you as a kid anyway, there wasn't a single time when that family got together that some of the uncles didn't wind up wrestling. (laughs) I mean, they just did. Like, it didn't even occur to me that doesn't happen in today's society anymore. Right. And, you know, if we get together, I don't want to wrestle you guys. Like, what's someone's going to hurt something. You know what I mean? Like, that worked in the 80s and the 90s. But it's not, I don't want to do that now. You know what I mean? Like, it were. I mean, if you guys want to wrestle, go for it. I just... It's not it's not the same. So like You're all now. back in the eighties and nineties, there was there was still a way for grown ass men 
to have physical contact with each other and like test each other's wit and moves and strength against each other. And it didn't really matter. It's like sparring, you know, it's like Lincoln and Jackson tussling. It's good for them. If it, you know, as long as they're not angry, I love when they tussle. It's great. Um, but even them, if I think about it, they don't ever really wrestle. Like I grew up wrestling my sisters every chance I would get, you know, like I had two older sisters. I'd wrestle them. I'd wrestle, I'd wrestle whoever I could get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not the same anymore. People don't wrestle like they used to. Um, and those same uncles, you know, if we got together, you know, now they wouldn't wrestle either. I mean, they're older and w- whatever. And I don't, I wouldn't wrestle my cousins if we got together either. Like it's kind of weird now, but something about the eighties and nineties, you got together in a family gathering and it was all in good. No one, no one was angry. It was for right. fun, but it was like a physical outlet that seems to not exist anymore. And jujitsu is a way that that actually still exists, but it's structured and, and it, there's a science to it and there's technique and it's a sport. And I just think that's, um, it's, it's accomplishing so far, like what I was hoping, which is like you get to have an outlet for some of that and experience some wins and losses in a way that's safe and it's structured and it's a, it's a sport. So if you get tapped out, guess what? No big deal. What are you going to do? Get angry? No, that's, that's immature. Just figure out what you did wrong and then try to do it better next time. And that constant improvement is what I was asking. How important do you think it is as now men, we're all men now, to really understand like our, okay, maybe it's a physical status. Like what is our pecking order in any given situation? Like I always, Lauren, my wife, grew up with six girls. She's the second of six girls. So... The idea of boys is completely and utterly foreign to her. <laughs> she doesn't understand why they are always like fighting and getting, you know, wrestling with each other. And I always, again, another one of my jokes is like they're pushing against the world to see if it pushes back. Right. Like that's, that's why we as, as, as men and as boys, it starts young. We, we try things, you know, dad said, no, I'm going to try it anyway. You're right. I want to. I'm pushing against him. Is he going to push back? Right. He. I'm pushing against my brother, older, younger, whatever it may be. I'm going to see if they push back. You know. Again, going back to this idea of in today's society, I'm. I'm with you. When I was growing up, me and my older brother, it was just a, a ritual. I mean, we scooted all the couches and chairs yep. against the walls, and we just wrestled. I mean, hardcore sometimes. Um, but now in today's society, we don't have that opportunity. You know, again, if we was going to war, I mean, that's why we had the, the Olympics began in the beginning was because they were trying to find out who was the best fighters, who would go off to war. It became eventually a sport and became global, right? I think this idea of testing, I think testing ourselves as, as men is a very beneficial thing that maybe we we lose out on i mean how how important do you think that is as as we get older so i I think that go ahead tito i I was gonna say i think it's vital for everyone to know what their capabilities Mm -hmm. are in all facets of life right and violence is one of them right and we live in a society that a lot of people and i may get hate for this but have it been punched in the face and so there's a sense of um, there's no consequences for my actions. Right. Right. You Now, jiu-jitsu, anything else, whatever, you get in a mat, um, and I'm usually the smaller guy. Push on the outlet. In, 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 in my class. It. Yep. And uh, it's, I, which I prefer, because in my mind, if I ever have to go to toe-to-toe with someone, it's not going to be a five foot six, 165-pound guy. It's going to be a a five, nine, 200 pound dude that I'm going to have to protect myself from. And so I think it's a very important for men to push themselves. Actually, I would, I'd say all people, not just men to really understand what their capabilities are and where they fall short. And with that knowledge comes power. They, they can then take that and say, you know, we're one of the few species, if not the only species that can then train ourselves to become better and overcome those challenges um, and really improve our capabilities in all, you know, and again, in any facet of life. So I, I think it's from 
boys fighting with each other or, or a martial art or whatever it may be. I think it's very important to really push to see how much you get pushed back, you learn, and you continue to grow, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing to know what you are capable of. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's, there's some guys that, that I've met that they've said it is a really cool feeling to walk into a room and know that you can take everyone's life with your bare hands <laughs> and they not even know it. Right. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm, I'm you know, shaking in my boots just yeah, here. Yeah, you know, right. It's like, but, y- you know, they they understand that side of the coin, but they're also understand the other side of the coin where it's like, I know how to be very passive. It's the responsibility of that. Correct. Right. And, and it's hard to say that you're a good person when you don't know how to do the opposite. Right. It's like, mm, you're good because you're weak. Right. Not because you're capable of of, of, of of this other side. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is one of the, but you should do it in a way that's structured, mm-hmm. that there's a system and a process and there's boundaries and there's, and that's what you get with jujitsu. I, I don't recommend, in other words, I would do, do that testing outside of real life so that, so that you can figure out what your boundaries are and your skill set is. Don't do it in real life. Yeah, you no, know, go, go, I wouldn't recommend going to a bar fight. Fu- no, no, start no, no, bar no. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Test yourself. But one of the things that I've noticed, and also like, if there's always going to be someone that beats you there, mm-hmm. there is, at some point, someone's going to beat Gordon Ryan at some point um, might be a while, but at some point uh, Tito could take, take me, you know what I mean? But I'm not scared around Tito. I don't, um, I don't feel like I'm lesser of a man around Tito, but hundred percent he could take me. I mean, so, but having that, I think it increases your, I don't think I know. It increases your confidence. Um, this is like you're, I probably heard, I mean, you just said it, but I mean, I think I've heard it from at least three or four other guys that train. Like one of the guys at a CrossFit gym used to be at CrossFit class every day. And now I never see him because he, he's got two into jujitsu. And he was saying like to carry that level of confidence around, if something goes down at a bar and he's a, um, I think he's a purple belt. If something goes down at a bar unless randomly some black belts in there or whatever, go to the average bar on Broadway. Something goes down, he's going to be able to handle it. And he is. I mean, he's going to be able to handle 99% of what happens in real life. He's going to handle it just fine. And that level of confidence, when you look at um, Gordon Ryan, who we were talking about earlier, he's won like 57 straight fights, and he's the best. And Nogi, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Gordon Ryan is is the, the greatest of all time. He's only 26 years old. Just look at the way he walks. Right. Total confidence. And when you can, when you know deep down, like you can take, in his case, he can take the life, if he so choose, of other world-class competitors. I mean, literally with jujitsu, you, you, I mean, you can take, you can break someone's arm, you can pop their knee, you can pop their, their ankle, you can choke them out. But if you break someone's arm, then it's only a matter, it's only a few more minutes before you're choking them out. And so... It, I'm saying if something goes down in real life. And so, obviously, in, in, in jiu-jitsu, if you get someone in a choke and they know they're, they they tap out. But let's be honest. If you hold that choke long yeah. enough, they're dead. So this is a sport that, by nature of it, you are learning how to take someone's life if it should happen with your bare hands. And when you see, like, him walking around, you can just see total confidence. Um, and I think that having that tool in your toolkit – is uh, like it bleeds over. We were talking about things that bleed over into other areas of life with CrossFit. It bleeds over into other areas of life with this, with this too. Right. Yeah. Because I, I just think that I think with, you know, it's important whether it be physical. I mean, I, I've never done jujitsu. We've talked about Krav Maga. You know, I don't know which one would be better. Everybody that's in jujitsu says jujitsu. Well, I've never even heard of Krav Maga, so I'm pretty sure it's. You know what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I, I, don't know. <laughs> I would definitely say that. I'm joking. I don't think there is an I, end all. Thing. I don't have a skin in this yeah. game, man. No, I, I don't, don't know. Either. I, I don't either. There's a reason why I said uh, jujitsu is a, a tool in the toolbox. Right. I, I don't think that it is the end all be all. Um, and the last thing you want to do in a bar fight or in a, in the fight in the streets is to be on your back. You don't know if he's got friends nearby that are going to come curb stomp you. Uh, you know, yeah. there, there's a lot of reasons why I would say. It is not the end all be all, but 
ninety percent of the time the fights do end up on the ground. So right. it's it's a good idea to know what to do in those situations. Right. So, but maybe you should know how to throw a punch. <laughs> maybe you should know how to how to throw yeah. a kick. Right. Right. Yep. Um, but but I'm just saying I was just saying you know for me you know that I haven't I haven't experienced that in life but. I th- you know, f- uh, on the other side of it with business and whether it's business or work or, you know, training at the gym five days a week or whatever it may be, you know, I think there is a sense of satisfaction when you hit your limit. I think you were mentioning this earlier where, or, you know, you go, you find, you know, maybe you're winning five in a row and then you go to this next person and they just utterly kick your ass. You know, it sucks. But there's a sense of like, okay, I get it. Now I've hit my boundary. Let's train. Let's get better. You know, in, in the world of financial like gain and, and building businesses, I think it's good to be like, go. you go out, you're going to put in the same kind of way. You push yourself until you get your ass kicked. You're like, okay, this is where my limit is. I, I just think that us as men understanding where our limits are is, is very important. Mm-hmm. It's yep. very important um, because I think it's ultimately what pushes us to get better, to grind. And I mean, if we don't, if we're not living a life of at least trying to improve ourselves, what kind of true life are we living? Right. If we're not living a type of life that we're like, I'm going to get better, whether it's in, in any and all aspects of life. Um, I just, I just struggle to think that we're going to live in the sense of fulfillment that we can truly walk in. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I think we, if you're not constantly improving, we're, we're, if we're not constantly improving, but we're not constantly failing. Oh, yeah. sure. Like, yep. like yep. as testing a, your limits, testing your limits. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think for me, I have failed in business so many times and in so many ways, but that has allowed me to see exponential growth over the last 24 months. Right. And then you fell again. You know, I just think it's part of the human or at least the masculine experience to to I think it's an ingrained in us to need that. I wanted to circle back around to doing hard things and Drell and Alan. What do you guys do in your life deliberately or maybe, you know, subconsciously? But now that you think about it, you're doing it to import some amount of heart into your life. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of, I do want to bounce back a little bit to that and what you said. I think, I think it with, with the failure thing, just not being scared of failure, not having a fear of failure and also finding ways to celebrate failure to a certain extent of like viewing it as a like, okay, I mean, like I hit a wall and that's all right. Like, and not taking it as a, as a punch in the face and being like, well, now I'm like, I'm out. Like I'm, I'm an idiot. I, you know, taking your self identity and just throwing it into the ground. Like, I think, I think we can do a better job as men of encouraging each other in failure. Right. Um, because like you said, in business, how, how many times have you failed in business? Like how many guys that have big businesses have failed? Almost every single one of them has. And so, but it's almost like a, it's almost like a rite of passage. It's like a, it's like a celebrated thing of like, man, like at least you went out there and figured out what you could do and what you couldn't do. Um, and so like, I, I think that's something that for me just lately, just been thinking a lot about is like, how do I, how do I help celebrate failure? Um, it sounds kind of weird to say it like that, but like just finding ways to see the good in failure and not just viewing it as like a, like just throwing it out. Um, I think for me to answer your question, Kent, um, I'm, I do a lot of sales. I'm in sales a lot. Um, and it's not something that, I mean, I like it. I wouldn't say I love it. Um, there's a lot of times where I have to push myself to go out and talk to people face to face over the phone. Um, and in sales, you just, you hear a lot of no's like almost probably 90% of the time, if not more than that, you're hearing no's and, and you listen to any sales coach and they're going to tell you all the same thing. It's like, yeah, you get all these no's for that one. Yes. Um, but it, it is something to like, you know, I think with, with sales for me, it's like, you know, that's something that I do. Um, it's part of my profession. It's part of what I do, but, and I don't necessarily love it, but I definitely know that it's helped me grow, Mm -hmm. not even just 
just socially, but, but even just to, to hear those no's and not realize that that, or to not think that that person's taking a personal shot at me or, or that affecting my identity of who I am because they said no to something that I'm trying to sell them. But it's crazy how fast I can take that no and just, and take it so personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and just disconnecting that no from, you know, uh, just the fact that they don't want it and that's fine. Um, so I think, you know, that, that can be really hard for me because, because me naturally as a person, I can tend to be a people pleaser, um, which is a, a trait that I am quickly trying to, to get rid of or minimize as much as I possibly can. Um, because I realize that that's toxic, but I also, you know, but I, I think that's what is so hard for me in sales. It pushes me to be like, you know what, like push past that. No push past that little mini, like battle that you may have lost and go to the next one. And, and when you get that victory, realize that, wow, like that's really like, it's really like, it just gives you that sense of like, man, like I, I just achieved that. Like that was, that was something that I heard how many knows, but I got that one. Yes. And, um, it pushes you onto that next victory. And so that definitely sales for me is something that, um, I put myself into, I always thought I would enjoy it. And I do naturally there's natural things of the, about my personality that makes me good at sales. But at the same time, I don't always love it. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I choose to stay there because I think it's a, I think it's a, I think there's a lot of good life lessons to, to be, to be taught in just hearing those and understanding that you can move past them and, and continue to push forward. Mm -hmm. um, so sales is definitely one of those and, and volleyball, I mean, sports athletics for me. I mean, they, no, that's really, interesting. I would have thought like athletics would be something like, you would just like to do, want to do, totally enjoy, but you're putting it in the category of like doing hard things. Yeah. I mean, I, I never, uh, I always push myself to play, to play the best mm -hmm. or I, 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 I'm always playing. If there's a level to be played, I want to play in the upper level. I want to play in the top level and you know, I might get my butt kicked. Well, actually most times I do. Um, my sports volleyball, I love volleyball, play a lot of it, play a ton of it. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of guys that are taller than me and can hit harder than me and can block better than me and whatever. But, you know, I view that as a challenge to like, you know, my, my dad always instilled that in me when I was younger. It's just like, you know, what? it's not about the fact that they might have physical attributes that are different than you. It's about the, it's, it's the fight and the dog. Um, and so I just, I really enjoy, I mean, yeah, I enjoy the sport. Don't get me wrong. I love, I love volleyball, but there's a lot of you know, if there's a chance, if there's an opportunity for me to take the harder road and, and take a higher level, I'm going to do it because, you know, I just enjoy that challenge. Um, so, yeah, athletics, definitely sports for me has taught me a lot of lessons in that as well. How about you, Alan? What uh, hard do you incorporate into your life? From a physical perspective, um, I've came to the point I work out five or six days a week generally. Um Five or six days a week? Are you bullshitting right now? No, I'm not. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I have three really hard days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, on this new program. I was doing five full days of full body. Um, I'm doing this new new program now where I do Monday, Wednesday, Friday super hard. I work out about hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes a day. Um, wow. That's, dude, that's so much, man. Dude, that's impressive. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. But I get there. Well, what I, what I do is I get there. I spend the first 15 minutes in meditation, kind of getting my head right, you know, visualization. And then I start warming up. I work out at the gym. So I, as soon as I drop off my boys at 8, I get there. Where do you go? Um, 10, 1440. Okay. It's just a gym. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have to have programs because... I, I, I don't know enough about fitness to do anything on my own. So I have to have, I have to have programs. Um, so the, the program that I'm on now, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's about an hour, hour and a half workout. Um, and then Tuesday, Thursday, I go in again, I do my visualization of workout. I do, uh, warming up and then I do what they call trigger sessions, which is kind of an easier day. It ends up being about a 40 minute workout, but it's like super easy. You're just pretty much doing enough to trigger your nervous system. Hey, you need to keep building. Mm -hmm. So you're not tearing down any muscle. You're just saying, Hey, work out this muscle, keep growing this muscle. It keeps yourself in a constant growth without, mm -hmm. without 
tearing anything down those other two days. And then I do like my ab workouts on the easy days. Mm -hmm. So, and then I try, I've been trying to do yoga on Saturdays. So nice. I do, a, I do a yoga on Saturdays. So, I, I mean, and I really, I really fell in love with it because Kent, you know, this, um, I don't think the other two do, but you know, I was 235 pounds a few years ago and then was able to drop down quite a bit. And then two years ago, I'm like, man, I gotta get my health in order. So I got my brother-in-law and started doing personal training with me. Literally the first day at the gym, I threw up three times. Cheapers, man. Yeah. That's how you know you're not doing it right. <laughs> Seriously, you're not supposed to throw up when no, you're working. I out. threw up because a I had a cigar right before I went to the gym, which was a terrible oh idea. You know what? Goodness. You're right. You did need to hit Ter it. Yeah, you straight. do <laughs> need to throw up. Dude. Terrible <laughs> idea. But also, I mean, I hadn't I hadn't really consistently worked out in months. Like like I, I would go to CrossFit, but the thing with CrossFit is, as you know, if you don't hit the five thirty, you're not going to work out till seven. And I'm like, shit. Do I want to go home at seven? You know, so it has helped kind of create structure, the structure in my life that like, I, I don't, I don't ask questions. I drop off my boys. I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, Hey, can you meet me at nine? I say, I can't, I'm committed. I got commitments at nine o'clock. My commitment is at the gym. Right. So yeah. they don't have to know what my commitments are. Heck yeah, man. All they know is I'm committed. Until ten o'clock, you're gonna throw up tonight after smoking two pots. Two oh man, I don't, even, I don't even, I don't even, I don't even have a buzz. What <laughs> that? oh, that's um, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, I mean, from a physical level, that's what I'm trying to do, and I, I have, I really have thought about either doing jujitsu or Krav Maga. I want to, I, I am wanting to do something that I can do with the boys. That again teaches me something teaches them something but would also give the opportunity to go home and create a connection with them so um that's why i'm asking about the two but I, I, on, on the other issues like like business i'm constantly trying to push myself um you know like right now we got 10 10 projects we got eight new constructions going two flips we just bought that 120 acre um, development that we're getting the engineering on, you know, we'll, and I just launched a new, new company, um, a development company where we're going to start, you know, kind of doing the same thing we're doing for me, but I'm doing it for like investors and homeowners and stuff, you know? And so for me, I'm always kind of thinking like, how do we grow? How do we, how do I, how do I reach my limit? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, doing those hard things of like, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to, we're going to figure it out. What do you guys think? Um, this is related, but it's changing. It's a, it's a slight turn. What do you guys think um, is most? All right. What do women today not understand about men today? I'm going to let Tito or draw. Huh? You guys do this one. <laughs> Where do you feel like even even your wives great great place to start like where in general do you feel like women may not be fully understanding how a dude works thinks gets fulfillment joy uh, pain you go first it, fears no I think it I mean I I think for me it's almost the um, not necessarily, maybe not necessarily with my wife, but just like the desire for like adventure mm -hmm. and the desire to um, take some risks. Um, because, I mean, my wife isn't necessarily like that. Uh, she doesn't necessarily love risk. I don't know that. I mean, I don't, I don't know that a, a ton of women in general maybe like that. And maybe that's a general statement, but like, I do think that men are specifically me. I love a challenge. I love a risk. I love taking, um, confident steps and faith. And, and like, I think that, um, it, it's maybe hard for, for, for my wife to understand that sometimes of like, well, why would you even, why would you even risk that? Like, and it's like, why well, don't, it's not, I'm not looking at the failure part of it. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at what, what could be. Um, and so I see the potential there and I'm like, man, I just like, I, 
I can see it. Like I can see it happening. I can see it's even like, um, something as simple as like when we bought our house, uh, Alan actually helped us, helped us get us our house when we moved down here. She hated that house <laughs> and it was like, you know, now that we're in there and, and we have it all fixed up and, and we've seen it and we're living in it. Bro, I like, saw it before you fixed it up. <laughs> I can see why she hated it. <laughs> you made it pretty freaking awesome in a very short amount of time. It's she crazy. wasn't pretty, man. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but like, it wasn't even about the look of the house. It was just like, you see the potential of what it's, what it could be mm-hmm. and the potential of what that property could be worth down the, down the road. And Um, what, what some, just some minor things could make that house look like and, and up the value of the house and resale and all that stuff. But it was just like, it was almost like it was a really big risk for her and she couldn't even, like, she couldn't even see that. And now we look back and it's like, wow, we're so glad we're here. Like, this is a great, this is a great little house, you know? Um, but it took risk. It took, it took a step of faith and being like, you know what? Yeah, we're just going to go for it. And so maybe, you know, maybe it's not what we think it was and that's all right. Um, but I think that's just that, th- I just have that desire to, to, to take those risks and to take steps of faith and, um, and, and I guess, yeah, I don't know. Um, just doing that together with her has been a journey, but, um, but we, we help each other in that area. You know, she, she, she can, she can also, you know, bring the, maybe the voice of reasons in s- certain situations mm-hmm. too that, Absolutely. that I need. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think maybe that's a, that's a pretty big one for me. I think. Uh huh. Risk taking. What do you guys think? Tito's wheels are spinning. Yeah, they are. I believe my relationship with my wife is not the norm. I feel like uh, our our level of communication is pretty honest, so I can convey how I'm feeling or, or the struggles I'm having. But I think some of the, maybe her ability to connect the dots um, is not like necessarily failure her part. It's more of my ability to convey information you know, more accurately. But I think in general, understanding the struggles that a, a, a male has to go through to become something and then the burden that they feel in order to maintain it In general, I think we we always have to live a very transactional life that my worth and my value really does come contingent upon me providing X, Y, and Z, Mm -hmm. which is outside of the outside of the gospel. That is a very difficult life to to take on Um, within the gospel. I think it is having grace, having mercy, being able to understand that that burden is not on my shoulders completely that it has been elevated by somebody else and that faith is really gonna really take over Mm -hmm. Um, i think the the internal dialogue that a man has in what their identity is whether it is established by the efforts from their labor or their identity and their beliefs I, i i think there's always a internal dialogue of what our identity is really based on and i think that comes outward in our actions and and looking for challenges or doing risky things. A lot of it, I think, comes down to where is my identity? Am I finding it in my hobbies? Am I finding it in the, the approval of other men? Am I finding that in my success of my career? Right. Um, and I think a lot of us struggle knowing where that identity comes in. And, and when we don't have it, um, for the friends that I've seen that kind of struggle with this too, is is, is very detrimental to the marriage. And so I, I, I think that, in summary, I, I think in general, I think women don't really understand that battle that men tend to have ongoing in their lives day in, day out. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's overgeneralization of all men, but I, at least for me, I feel like, the women in my life, my, my wife, my sisters, my mom, um, I think there's this idea that, or maybe I, I, I perceive that I have to have it all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the one area I think of is <clears throat> that guy, Chamath, that I mentioned earlier. He was on Lex Friedman's podcast, and it, I, I saw the name kind of stand out, and I don't 
listen to every single Lex podcast. But oh, Hodger Gracie was on Lex's podcast recently too. Did you listen to that? Mm-hmm. It's really, really good, man. It's um, Lex Friedman, F R I D, man. Anyhow, um, Jameth was saying one thing that happened to him was he thought growing up poor that it was all about getting rich. And when he got rich, because he did get rich, he, like young, I don't know, it was in his late 20s or early 30s, like he hit it, it was big. But at that point, then his dad changed the goal and made it all about who he was as a person. And he felt like, what, what are you doing to me? You changed the goal here. I thought it was, I thought I would please you by getting rich. Now I'm rich as crap. Now it's about the kind of a person I am. And I think that might also be the case. I talked about this a little bit with Mariana, but not in depth. So I'm curious to know if women feel that way also. But when he said that, I was like, you know what? I think that a lot of dudes feel like the goal keeps changing on them. Mm -hmm. Like what you're supposed Mm -hmm. to work towards keeps changing. And then you're like, well, what the, what the heck? Like, uh, I, I thought that I thought life was about this. And then it becomes now life is about this. Like, you know, it could be that Lincoln feels right now that, you know, that one of the goals in his life is to, you know, do, do good at school, but also to, to become like a good contributor on his basketball team. But at some point he may feel like, well, life's about finding a, a really great girlfriend. And then it's about like having a good marriage. And then it might be about maybe having kids. And then maybe it's about doing well in business. And then it's maybe it's about, well, that doesn't matter. Now it's about you, who you become as a person. Then maybe that doesn't matter so much. And now it's about, you know, it does feel to me like um, I have felt that where like the goal changes and you're trying to like go through life, trying to figure out like what you're supposed to do next. And then you succeed at something maybe. And then it's about something else. I feel like maybe that might be more of a, a man's issue than a woman's, but I don't actually, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I, I haven't talked with, enough of I haven't talked with Marianne or really any other women about it to know like if they feel that way but I think I think a lot of dudes might feel that way yeah my wife has done a great job at of giving me feedback you know and telling me hey you're doing a great job hey you're you're messing up but I, I think what helps identify that goal of what we're working towards is helped by having community of, of like-minded individuals accountability um, I definitely have seen men achieve success and by that by their achievement it almost gives them free reign to do other things that they normally wouldn't have it's almost like I've, I've unlocked this privilege now to do things I normally wouldn't and, and I think a lot of that is, you know, we need to be held accountable to what are we actually working for? Why are we here on this earth? You know, what is uh, our end goal here? And I think if we lose sight of that, which is very easy to in today's day and age. Yes. Yes. It's very difficult. And that's a constant the gospel, gospel can bring into play, like really like nothing else. Where if you can have that as a your north star, mm-hmm. whatever else you think is a, a secondary goal or something good, maybe to work towards or to take your life towards next, having that as sort of a constant yeah, um, can, can be really yeah. helpful. I think, uh, I do think in general, this is generalization, so this is, uh, you know, I know this isn't the best, but I don't know how else to go about it. I think in general, women don't understand how important sex is to, to a dude. Like, I'm talking like, like, we're all married, right? Like, it's good. They're good marriages. Um, and I just think in general, and, and I'm not like, I don't have any issues on that front. So I feel like I have the best wife in the entire world. But if a dude is like, I just, I, I, I feel like it gets joked about, you know, a lot and made light of a lot. And it's fine, whatever. I, I like making jokes. Um but I'm not sure that all women understand how important that is to a dude. And I don't even think that's, and I'm not saying like it's, I just think that's some, it's built into creation somehow. Like, 
it just is, it seems like. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you ask me. I, I agree, first off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think that... In other words, can I put a fine point on that? Like, Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I would have to think if some dude is routinely... All right, first of all, you got to earn, right? Like, you have to earn intimacy. You have to earn trust. You have to earn that mutually beneficial, enjoyable, sure. pleasurable experience you 100 percent. you have to earn it um by being selfless and responsible and caring and all, all of these these things but i think that um let's say a dude is doing that let's say he's doing all the right things and he's getting like turned down semi-consistently i feel like that takes that guy's backbone and rips it out in a way that it's maybe hard to understand if you're not a dude. Is that fair? I, I think that I think that a lot of a lot of that has to do with the fundamental need of a man to conquer. Hmm. Right? Like hmm. I mean we're yeah, sure. we're we're built to desire to conquer things. Whatever uh, what <clears throat> our world we want to conquer our world. Whether our world is business, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's our wives in a sexual sense Whatever we choose our world to be, it is, it is in our nature to want to conquer whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? To go out. I mean, this is why we can look on Ju people like Julius Caesar and be like, I get it. I, yeah, if I had the ability, I would do it too. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Because, I mean, whatever, and again, the, the difference is, is we get to choose what world we're choosing to conquer. But, I mean... I don't think I don't know very many men living in their their full selves, looking at where they are and be like, oh, I'm good, right? I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't, but I don't see very many happy men doing that, mm -hmm. right? And I have the fundamental belief that like boys never change; we just evolve, right? And what I see my boys doing, I'm doing today as a, as a guy, right? We we keep, we talk about testing limits, okay? I mean, no, I think that it goes to this goal thing you're talking about before of like, okay, I, I set this goal and now I hit the goal. Well, now the goal's over here. Now I got it. Now I got the goals over here. Like, you know, I think we tell ourselves that at one point, at some point in our life, the conquering will be over, but it's never going to be over. Right. We're always going to have this fundal, fundamental need and desire to conquer. Maybe you get old and you retire and you're going to conquer the golf course, right? But when, how many men, when you get old, they just retire, they sit at the house, what do we do? We die because there's nothing left to conquer, right? We, I think we fundamentally need that as men. And I think that's not necessarily something that's inherent in women, and I think that's one of the reasons why Lauren just doesn't understand why do you have to fight all the time as boys. Mm -hmm. And I get on to them, like, don't punch your brother so hard. But I don't get on to them as much because I'm like, I understand. Mm -hmm. I get it. You need to know who you are. You need to you need to figure that out. And with sex, I think what rips out the the backbone of a man is because he he's married. He wants to have this feeling of conquering his wife. Right. And a lot of women want to be conquered by their husbands in a sense, you know, and this, I'm not talking about it in a weird toxic way, but I mean, that's what we want. And when you're not able to quote unquote conquer your wife, the person that you are the most intimate with, I think it speaks to the inner parts of a man's soul. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. am I worthy? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. am I a man? Mm -hmm. Am I masculine? Mm -hmm. Do I have what it takes? Yep. Right. Um, and, and I think that, because I think it's just so much more than the physical sex. It's so much more than the physical release for a guy. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. It speaks to a deeper part of us mm -hmm. that just needs to feel like I'm a man. I have something to give my wife that only I can give her. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to us. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that over that, that spills over to every aspect of our life. I, I think if we're, if when if we're we can come to this point where we're self aware to know like when I conquer X, there's just something else I'm going to have to do, mm -hmm. right? I think 
I think where we where we get as men is we think when I conquer this city, when I get to a million net worth, ten million, a hundred million net worth, like that's when I'm going to be happy. So we spend all this time conquering, quote unquote, only to conquer. We stop, and what's our life here for now? Yeah. Yep. My uncle, he he was a builder and he was very successful, and he used to tell me all the time, like, "I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna stop," and I said, "You ain't gonna do it. You are not." going to do it. I said, you cannot go from a hundred to zero overnight. You just can't do yeah. it. He's like, I bet I can. And then I was, I saw him about it, you know, nine months later and he was back to work. I said, I told you, yeah. <laughs> you can't do it. Yep. You know, yep. and because there's that fundamental need. Right. Yep. And, and for him, it was, it was work. It was business. He didn't need the money. He needed what that activity gave him. Exactly. Exactly. I also think um, most dudes, if not all dudes, generally speaking, are way more sensitive than most people know or most women know, because we do a pretty good job on not letting ourselves appear sensitive, right? Do a pretty good job on like making right. it look like stuff doesn't phase us or that word doesn't phase us or that comment or, you know, but I just think when I see like, when I look kind of across the landscape today of like the modern American man, I just see a lot of hurt, a yeah. lot of hurt that's bottled up. And, and, and then people think it's like it, then it, it causes them to do dumb stuff. And then it looks like the, the problem that, that you're seeing is like, well, he's just, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it is, like not conducting himself properly underneath. That's just a ton of hurt. So I just think, in general, dudes are more sensitive than they would be than a lot of people may think. Oh, I, I'm I'm a I'm a huge baby. I cry at movies all the time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm right, secure. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's almost ten thirty, so oh, I don't want to keep you guys all night, but this was fun. We got the the mics warm back up again. Colby, we got the Thank videos you, working. <laughs> Colby's the man. All figured Colby's out. Awesome. Plan. Um, one thing I did want to say. So uh, this was a couple weeks ago. I was at a um, men's conference back in Pennsylvania. And we had times of prayer. We had times of worship. We had times of guys like just, I mean, crazy, crazy stuff happening. It was awesome. But one thing I realized in that time was, you know, we all we're all struggling basically with the same things yeah. just in different different uh it might look different for certain people but for the for the most sense we're all struggling with the same things and it took a couple guys being vulnerable and getting up and speaking at that conference for other guys to realize that like wow this isn't just me and then when when the when guys started going up and, and just like sharing these things and then more guys came up and it was just like before you knew it everybody was up front and they're just like man we're all struggling with it. you know this is something we're all dealing with um but what i wanted to say i just kind of like as encouragement is when we were got through all that stuff prayed about it prayed it off broke chains whatever we were worshiping together and there is something about like you can't tell me that the devil doesn't love when guys are keeping things like those, th th those things to ourselves, thinking that we're the only ones that do it. Because I know for a fact, when we were worshiping together, there was something that broke that was just like super powerful um, with a bunch of guys just together, united, worshiping together. It was a lot more powerful than just your regular worship service at church. Mm. Um, and so as encouragement of just like, you know, vulnerability is not a bad thing, but we as men striving towards the same goals together and sharing with each other and sharing the hard things together with guys that understand what we're dealing with and what we're going through. And we can speak into each other's lives and encourage each other in those things because we understand it is very, very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like an encouragement for guys that, you know, guys that are listening to the podcast, guys that are wondering about these things. I mean, there's, you know, it is awesome when, when men come together and we all strive for those same goals and we share and we're vulnerable with each other. Um, there's something that breaks. Um, 
and, and it's just like a yeah it's it's a supercharging <laughs> Um, well, what stands out to me about that is <clears throat> like that wasn't just sort of a normal little Bible study. Like you, you, were, you right. guys were on mission together. Yep. It comes back to what Tito was saying. Like you were actually doing work together. It was spiritual yep. work, but like you were accomplishing something together, together. Yep. you know, and it was yep. dudes like, it, 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 you know, yeah, I think that that's what stands out to me about that. You had a brotherhood in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Tito, thanks for bringing all your bourbon, man. Dude. So you brought Stag, Stag, Stag Junior, <laughs> Thomas H. Handy. What? I didn't even have any of that. Which Weller is this one right here? Uh, that's the foolproof. How does that compare to the one I'm drinking? Uh, I, I prefer the foolproof. Well, doggone it, man! When I was <laughs> pointing at it, you should have helped me out, man. Try it. <laughs> we got time. Hey, I have all the time you guys have, but I don't. I'd never drink alcohol anymore. The last time I drank. Except if I'm out to dinner or with, uh, you know, in this case. But here's, like, one of my best friends in the entire world. We see each other, like, four to six times a year. It's crazy. We only live, what, 30 minutes apart. It's terrible. Um, but terrible. the one fun thing that we do maybe twice a year is we meet up at this little dive bar in Mount Juliet. And it's awesome. USA Sports Bar and Grill. Have you been there yet? Yeah, in Mount Juliet? There. Tito? No. no? USA, USA Sports, Sports Bar, USA it's a Sports classic. Bar and Grill, in Mount <laughs> yeah, Julia. It's a little hole in the wall. You can smoke cigars in inside, and um, I actually think their food is kind of good there. To be honest, their wings are yeah, their, their wings, wings are great. Great wings for a little dive bar. A hundred I mean, yes, and so I like to drive out to Mount Juliet a couple times a year to meet Alan, and bro, the last time we. Jarrell knows how much had fun was that? I had a meeting. With it actually was morning. a Thursday yeah. night. It was a Thursday night. <laughs> I came home from that. We had some beers and some whiskey and smoked that. All right, Dude, wait. the biggest cigar, the biggest blackest cigar you can imagine. Okay, we got to preface this too. We're at the end of the night. We'd already had like four or five beers apiece. What at least two shots each each already, right? Probably. And Kent Thursday goes. Night. And Kent goes. You want one more shot? <laughs> I, said, I did. I was feeling I, really good. I said, "Look, man, that's your call." I mean, what you know, whatever you think, that's yeah. your call. Then we shouldn't have had the last shot. I'll say that. <laughs> and um, but it was funny because I came home and Mariana was still up and she was in the living room. And I distinctly remember this. I walked in the door and I was like, "You know what? I think I've been a little too hard on alcohol. Like, there's a place for alcohol." And this, I had the best time with Alan and. About 10 minutes later, I started to feel it, <laughs> and I, my stomach started to turn, and I it literally felt like I had eaten poison. <laughs> my entire body started to feel poisoned, oh, and I was gosh. like, oh, shoot. And so we went to bed, and I'm laying in bed. I think I was laying in bed for like an hour. I couldn't sleep, and it kept getting worse. And, it, and then, you know what? It gets to the point where it's like, I wonder if you're going to throw up, like, Oh shoot! This feels like I'm gonna throw up. Oh shoot! I'm gonna throw up at some point. You know what I mean? That whole process <laughs> takes like twenty or thirty minutes, and I will do, I will do anything not to throw up. I, it's like the worst uh, thing in my entire life. And I love it. I love throwing up. <laughs> years ago, Mariana got a video of me throwing up when I had the flu or something, and because I, when I throw up, bro, it is loud. The house it's, is coming down. Oh, so much! I was laying in bed for an hour, and finally, I'm like. Hmm? This isn't going to work. So um, I go out to the backyard behind that sauna that you were in oh, tonight, nice. Terrell. Nice. Thought I saw completely something. naked <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night and just <laughs> retch my guts out <laughs> by that fence over there multiple times. And oh, I thought I had gosh. heard an owl. After I was done, I remember thinking, man, I feel like I heard an owl in the hedge row down there. So I went back in, got to sleep, and literally until that next morning I had a meeting with Jarrell at 7.30 or whatever, I got up at 5 and couldn't sleep. I went to a diner and drank two or three cups of coffee, ate pancakes. I was feeling completely poisoned. I think it was from the alcohol. I don't know. I was just totally poisoned. I barely could get through that meeting, and with – you, I felt sick until four o'clock that Golly. that night, and the next them. the next uh, week, I was at the gym, and one of the guys there 
knows my neighbor <laughs> across. I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, hey, uh, your neighbor heard you throwing up the other night. What was that about? And I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> here he was sitting out on his back porch at 11 o'clock at night with his wife. Oh, here and you just he vomit heard me everywhere. vomiting naked. my guts out in the did backyard. Naked. Completely <laughs> naked. Thankfully, they... he did not see me. <laughs> oh, man. And he did the owl call. That was Did the he owl really? that I heard <laughs> was him. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't come over. But anyhow, oh gosh. Um, well, thank, I, I feel really good having smoked two cigars and a little bit of bourbon. Thank, I, I thankfully, I just had fine. a little bit of a headache the next morning. That was about it. That was me. it. That was it. You know, maybe it was the food that you guys were talking about. Maybe the food isn't actually that good there. It was. I'm telling you, <laughs> the we, food is actually good there. I I should have I should have said no on that last shot. Been. It could have been food poisoning. I don't know because I haven't been sick like that in a while. So then I was like, you know what? I retract my statement about alcohol. It's straight straight poison. But it is. But it's good. good though. It is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with you. I actually I I rarely drink now. Really? Mm-mm. I mean. If I drink, I have to drink bourbon because beer just kind of blows mm-hmm. me up. So, and I mean, I'm just, I'm with you. If I'm not drinking with somebody, it's not as fun. Yeah. 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 You know. I can handle vodka the best. It's of all of them, I can handle vodka the best. Bourbon. I, I mean, I prefer to drink bourbon for sure. I used to drink but. a lot of rye, foolproof rye. I mean, it was a saw going down your throat. But uh, I, I was telling, I think I was telling Tito maybe, but. Now I think my esophagus lining has been eaten up so much I can't. It just burns Ooh. me. Yeah, right. It don't it don't hurt my throat, but when it gets right here, boom, uh, it hurts. Well, don't do that. I'm not. Oh, the thing I forgot to mention was the next day my dog's breath smelled a little bit like vomit. <laughs> oh <laughs> no! Oh, yeah, I never once thought about it. <laughs> he no. ate it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, it's gone now. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That's awesome. Oh, man. All right. What else, guys? Anything you guys want to say in closing? A lot of fun. Glad we did it. Thanks for the invite. Guys. This was awesome. Yeah, this was awesome. Yeah, I just really some honest it. conversation, man. I love that. Yep, absolutely. Um, well, this probably won't come out until probably January, right, Kobe? And then... Um, the plan for now is to release an episode every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central. It's on all the podcast channels and YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Check cool. it out there. All right, gentlemen. Thank you guys very much. Absolutely. Thank Good night, you everybody. Try to catch me hollering at the moon.